uh, whenever. Actually, I think I have. I think I have it set. You, you should no, no. Let me hear. That does seem to change. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there you go. I should be able to see it now. When the time comes. <laughs> If you want to try bringing up the screen, Maddie, just to see if there's any issues. Okay. I know uh, Doug Johnson said he might be a few minutes late tonight for the this part. No, I'm going to reiterate, but next meeting I will not be attending. I'll try and remember that. <laughs> oh, and I have to I have to bug out at 930. That's right, too. Yes. And I, I plan on being somewhere where there's no cell phone service and no internet. Sounds nice. <laughs> Marion Township. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Randy. Oh, no, actually, Porter, Indiana. <laughs> hey. hey, Doug. Hey, Tom, long time no see. Hey, Tom, long time no see. Yes. Hey, Tom. Okay. Uh, should we get started or? Probably is time pretty tight. I mean, if you think you need 45 minutes, you probably should. Okay. So, Maddie, do you want to get started? Okay. Here's Gina. Let me see. So she says she'll be a few minutes late. Tiffany, you can get started with the. Um, Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, hi, my name is Maddie Pelsha. I'm going into my senior year at Drexel University, uh, planning on graduating with degrees in chemical and environmental engineering. I'm passionate about climate mitigation and hope to make it part of my future career. Um, so I really appreciated this opportunity to work on Belfont's Climate Action Plan, so thank you. Um, so just going through what I'm going to be talking about today. Well, so this is a presentation from our, our when Joanne and I presented to the Climate Committee, the Pennsylvania Climate Action Committee. Um, so Joanne, are you still going to go through a background of Belfont? Uh, we, it'll, it'll be a little bit shorter, but yeah, because okay. I think everyone here knows what about that. Yeah. Okay. So we'll still, still hear from Joanne first. Um, so I'll go through the greenhouse gas inventory that I did last fall, talk about our task force, the creation of our task force, um, how we got community involvement, um, the vulnerability assessment that we did and how we came up with the emissions reduction strategies. Uh, so take it away, Joanne. Okay. So as you, uh, first of all, before I actually get started, I wanted to thank uh, Maddie for all of the work she did. This project started in July of last year. And at that time, uh, she was we were one of 20 communities that were selected for this climate action plan program. Uh, Maddie has been with us since the beginning. Some of the other communities, including State College, had two and sometimes three different uh, interns. Having had her for the entire time made for a continuity and great planning is for that. And the report that she uh, sent that I'll show a little bit after we do this presentation. Uh, is fantastic. I want to just to publicly acknowledge that. So as you can see, we're incorporating 1795. We're the home of seven governors and has a, a fun sort of thing. I found out recently that we're the birthplace of Jonathan Frakes, aka Commander Riker. Uh, 
as we all know, were the uh, known for our big screen railroad and iron industry, historic architecture, and kayaking and fly fishing. We're one of the smaller uh, communities in the state that is part of this program, uh, which in some ways makes it easier, in some ways makes it a little harder to do the mitigation. So next slide. So I wanted to show people at the state level, uh, both our commercial and our residential areas. So I took a picture of uh, High Street with the uh, 2020 census up and then took the, uh, an old picture of uh, Curtin Street to show some of the residential areas. And one of the things that we came up during the planning was that we have some real extreme weather issues, uh, particularly flooding down on uh, Spring Creek. So we did a, we sort of did a before and after picture, the one on the left, what Talleyrand Park normally looks like and what it looked like two years ago during the two floods we had that summer. Okay, thanks, Joanne. Mm -hmm. Um, so the program that Joanne and I already alluded to a little bit, I think it's called the PA Climate, Local Government Climate Action Program. Um, so uh, PA Department of Environmental Protection um, set up college students with local governments to work on their greenhouse gas inventory and climate action plan. And so to help the, the college students with this, um, they had ICLE um, give us webinars and one-on-one -on -one, um, calls to help us through the through the process. Um, so, so in fall term, uh, working on the greenhouse gas inventory, we used ICLE's program called ClearPath. So, like I said, we had webinars that walked us through each part of the process. At the very beginning, we had to choose a protocol to follow. So we chose the US community protocol as opposed to the global protocol or, or others. Um, and under that protocol, we chose scope one, which is in boundary. So within Belfont and direct emissions from within Belfont. So, so not emissions associated with the clothes that you buy if they're, they're made out of out of uh, the community or things like that. Um, so it was pretty much um, energy that was used within Belfont, water, um, waste production, transportation within Belfont. Um, so what we had to do fall term, we had to get data um, to put into ICLE's program ClearPath. Um, so that data was provided by the utilities like West Penn Power, Columbia Gas, um, the center county recycling and refuse um, amongst others. Some so, uh, Belfont itself provided some information and um, we contacted businesses like the rail company, although the rail company didn't have the information we needed. Um, but what does this data look like? Um, that's input into ClearPath. Um, so two things, activity data. So activity data is like, uh, for example, for electricity, that would be kilowatt hours of electricity. Um, so that it's a unit of, of activity. Um, and then the factor set with electricity would be the electricity mix. So different mixes of renewable energy versus fossil fuels produce different amounts of emissions per unit of activity. So um, these, these two together, factor set, which is emissions per unit of activity multiplied by unit of activity that gives emissions. Um, so that's that's what's happening within the clear path calculator. Um, so this is just an example of the page itself. So we input information for residential, commercial and industrial energy, transportation, solid waste, water and fugitive emissions. Um, for those that don't know fugitive emissions um, in our case were um, the emissions associated with leakages from natural gas distribution. So that kind of tied into the energy sector as well. Um, but this is on the residential energy page. Um, here are a few examples of calculators um, within ClearPath um, that can be used to calculate emissions per activity. 
under each sector. So within residential, I had I input into the natural gas, electricity, and heating fuel calculators. So if you go into them, they're actually really simple, at least for, for this one. So this is the natural gas example. So fuel use in therms was input. That was directly provided by Columbia Gas. So that was a really easy one. Um, and we also input the quality of data. So since this was uh, an exactly measured usage, that's really high quality data. And keeping track of that just gives us an idea of the uncertainty of the results. Uh, okay, so speaking of results, this is what clear path um, output uh, from all the emissions data. Um, so the main sectors that we have to focus on uh, it, within Belfont are residential and commercial energy and transportation. Um, and actually transportation is under underrepresented um, since we did scope one, so that's only in boundary. So that doesn't even take into consideration commutes outside of Belfont. Um, and I know um, from census data that there's a lot of commuting outside of outside of the borough. So that's actually underrepresented. Um, but again, those are the top three sectors to focus our actions on. So those are the highest emitting sectors. Uh, that was the end of fall term. So spring term, we kept going with the webinars led by ICLEI and they advised us to form a task group, task force within the, our communities. Um, so uh, we started getting ready to write the plan. We formed the task force with local and county government representatives, myself, um, concerned residents and business owners. So this is just our list of task force members. And we held regular meetings uh, we discussed planning, um, and that was really helpful for me because I could come in and say, well, we could put in more bike lanes. And then someone who lives here would say, well, it's really hilly here, so they better be electric bikes. Um, and that's just information that I wouldn't know. Um, I'm trying to think of another example. But yeah, it was really helpful for, for residents to, to have input into the plan. Um, and not just have this outside college student do it. Um, so our first um, task that we took, we had uh, we wanted community involvement to make sure that the plan was was going to be resilient and have a lot of people invested and involved. Um, so we started with um, a survey that was available electronically as well as. Um, a few were mailed out, and the ones that were mailed out received uh, over 50% response rate, which is unbelievable, um, actually. Um, and it was just uh, surveying general interest and asking for comments on some areas that the task force had already brainstormed on. Um, so I wanted to get an idea of what strategies the, com the community might be enthusiastic about um, so in this pie chart here, this chart um, is associated with a question that asked, um, what topic would you attend a workshop on to learn more about? Um, so you can kind of get an idea of community interest from this. Um, but the, the right side of the chart, um, renewable energy, winterization, and public transportation, those three actions have to do with the top three highest emitting sectors, transportation and commercial and residential energy. So it was nice to see a parallel between community interest in actions and actions that would actually have an impact on the highest emitting sectors. Um, so in addition to the survey, we followed that up with a focus group um, that was more in depth, uh, a more in depth discussion um, and that was over Zoom because we were well into quarantine at that point. Um, I see that we have a couple of faces from, from that focus group, so nice to see you again. Um, and the survey was, it had this more range of opinions. So this, this graph was the first question in the survey. Um, so overwhelmingly, people felt that climate change is an action that that climate action is something that they want to, seen, to be seen done by Belfont. 
Um, but as you can see, there were some negative responses, um, but that's also important to see and to know about. Um, but the focus group was a little different. It was people who were knowledgeable on the topic and uh, really wanted to see climate action be successful in the town. Um, and that was really helpful for our strategy prioritization. Again, the more input, um, the better from residents um, to make a really successful plan. Um, so it's also a key part of um, the climate action plan. It's not just mitigation and reduction of emissions, but also to adapt to the, the changing climate. Um, so it's important that a vulnerability assessment also be in the process. And that comes before to, um, prioritizing the actions that will go into the plan. Um, so ICLE advised us to use their other program, Temperate, um, but it wasn't free. So in the two week free trial, I, I got some data um, on flooding and high temperatures in Belfont, but I used Climate Explorer, which is a free um, program with data from NOAA and NASA. So it's a really good resource. Um, but as you can see, um, Belfont is projected to experience more extreme heat. That's the one on the top. That's average daily max temperature is the, the Y axis on the top and days per year with more than three inches precipitation is the Y axis on the bottom. And that's through uh, the rest of the century. Um, so the red is the projected um, heat on top and precipitation on bottom. Um, so as uh, as Joanne already pointed out before, um, flooding is seen as a current issue and will be more in the future. Um, so when we surveyed the community, they also agreed that there was a need for stormwater management. So um, sort of stormwater infrastructure in public spaces um, should be put into the plan as well as educational resources for residents to put on their own property. Um, yeah, and hopefully that will reduce damage of future flooding. Um, so finally, it was time to come up with uh, reduction strategies that would go into the plan. Um, so ICLE re recommended that we set targets and goals before before coming up with the actual um, the actual programs and policies that would go into the plan. So they recommended that we use the same targets as the state plan. That's an 80% reduction of 2005 level emissions by 2050. So since this was the 2017 data was used for this first greenhouse gas inventory, we don't really have 2005 emissions unless you extrapolate backwards. Um, but yeah, so we have that. And that's a really uh, ambitious goal, um, but it's something that well, to be honest, the state plan doesn't even achieve it. They, they still have a section called um, additional action required. Um, but but ICLE recommended this ambitious goal for us as well. Um, and then in the, in, the, in the task force, Joanne actually came up with this list. These are a couple examples of um, qualitative goals that we could have. Um, so as you can see, like increased electric vehicle charging, um, renewable energy transition away from heating fuels. Um, so over time through 2050, those are a couple markers that we could, could uh, strive for. Um, ClearPath also has forecasting and planning tools. So to get the forecasting tool, um, so in, in the forecasting tool, um, I input the um, projected population growth rate. Um, there's also a chance to put in carbon um, intensity um, factor. So that might reduce emissions over time as our electricity mix improves. But since Pennsylvania doesn't have um, plans to improve the electricity mix, um, I just left that as stable. Um, so really the forecast, which is the blue line on the top, is just the, it just grows with the population. 
Um, and then these um, other sectors at the bottom, those go with um, the greenhouse gas inventory sectors. And so I input a few, um, a few policies, which you can see on the right, um, such as increased electric vehicles, which you saw in the goal, more renewable energy in the mix, reducing electricity, transitioning away from heating fuels, weatherizing homes, um, reducing vehicle miles traveled and improving public transportation. All of these things go into these reductions that you see for each sector. So this is transportation in yellow, residential energy in blue. Um, so like I said before, our actions really focused on those highest emitting areas. Um, so in conclusion, um, as I said, residential and commercial energy and transportation are the highest emitting sectors for Belfont, which isn't a surprise. That's pretty normal for this size community. Um, the areas of vulnerability, the things that Belfont needs to adapt to in the future are extreme temperatures and extreme weather. Generally, there is positive community interest, so using that community interest for Belfont's advantage in, in the policies and programs put into the plan, that's, that's, a, that's a positive, um, it's positive that the community is, involved, is interested in being involved. And um, so these clear paths and the temperate uh, climate explorer, all these tools were really important for building an evidence-based plan. So it's not just a plan that says that we're going to put these actions together and hope, hope it reduces our emissions. It's really something that you can refer back to um, in the future as a kind of iterative process and look back and say, well, our emissions were this back then and have we, have we met our goals? Um, so those tools are really important for making those informed decisions. Um, so yeah, thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I, it was a great learning experience for me and I hope that the, the plan uh, moves forward. So just to update before she closes the screen, these inventory and planning tools that she's talking about at our presentation before the Climate Advisory Committee for the Department of Environmental Protection. We were told that we will have free access to these tools through the end of the year and possibly beyond that. We don't know how long, but that there will be, once we have to start paying for it, there will be a reduced co cost because we were part of this original uh, Climate Action Plan program. So if we can switch, allow me to share my screen, I'll show a little bit of the uh, climate action plan itself. Go ahead and try switching. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you see it? It's coming up. There you go. Okay. Uh, there. The, the, the report is probably 50 some odd pages long. Um, there are two important parts in here that I think uh, you as council members need to be looking at. We're not going to actually vote on accepting this report this evening because I want all of your input in looking at and making any additional changes before we actually accept the report. So as you will notice that there have already been a little bit of change around here. The first uh, section is on pages 12 to 14, and it is a summary of what we want to do by 2025, by 2035, and what we hope to achieve by 2050. So that we have benchmarks along the way, and we're not saying, well, we want to get to 2050, but we don't know what we need to do in the interim. So this will give you an idea of what the focus group the, and the task force came up with uh, in terms of general overall goals. Then if you, um, I'm gonna have to close this and 
and flip it over so I can get to the other section. So hold on just a second. Back. Then, okay. So then down on, from pages 25 to the end of the document, what we've got there is actually details for each of those different summarized goals that were presented up above. And there's a, So these, these icons show you what kind of impact each of these goals uh, and ideas for improving our community are from a small impact to a significant and what, what the co-benefits are like jobs, social equity, resource security, and improving public health and environmental quality. So here you see that this uh, retrofit existing commercial and municipal has a high impact and it infects all three areas. Then if you go to the next page, uh, looking at each objective to retrofit, this is just one example, retrofitting existing commercial municipal industrial uh, buildings to achieve a 35% reduction by 2050. It gives you some actions that can be done. Uh, if we're already in the process of doing those, what the benefits will be and which are the actors that we need to involve in order to uh, meet this goal. What you see here is some editing that we've already done uh, to say that we need, for in this particular case, we need public works to be involved because this is a uh, municipal issue. Uh, and some, and what we, I'd like all of you to do is over the next two weeks is to look look this and each of these uh, objectives up and add your input as to what other lead actors you think might be uh, a needed, necessary to uh, implement this, uh, this plan over the next 30 years. Um, the one of the first things that we'll need to do, let me go down to, I think it's at the end, let me find it. So uh, once we accept the plan, this month and year will be input to say when we will actually start working on it. That would include creating a climate action planning task force within the borough, sort of like an ABC, so that we have an ongoing group that can work with this plan to help make sure that we keep on track. Um, and what that group would be doing was reporting any changes and a, a two year and a five year period of these, these monitoring reports. So now I wanna open it up for questions. We have 15 minutes. Well, do I have this Randy? Uh, since nobody else is volunteering, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, a lot of work went into this. I'm, I'm not familiar with all of it, some of it I felt like I, I've seen it for the first time. I am curious though as to cost, cost to the borough, cost to the residents, cost to the utilities, cost to the rental owners yeah. uh, who own the buildings. Uh, and I'm wondering what, you know, where the numbers started. I, I didn't see that information. If, it, if we're working off of 2015, I think was the latest review that was done. That's part of what we need to do once we, we accept the report to find out where the costs are. Uh, some of the things like I know this afternoon we got a uh, thing from the county about uh, a climate action. I don't remember what they called it. So, but there would be funding available through the county to help implement some of this. Uh, 
Yes. There's also will be under the governor's uh, 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 climate action plan, there's funding available. We've already received actually some of the funding when we put in the electric charging stations. Uh, so the other parts of it may be uh, community input. Uh, some of it will be volunteer. At this point, we just looked at the basic plan and we need to look at going forward, what, what costs the borough, what costs the individuals. At this. In terms of the residential, that's all voluntary. And through education, we may be able to get more and more of the community, whether it's rent, homeowners or uh, landlords to make some of the changes in the residential area so that over time we can help improve this. It's, it, the plan isn't mandated, it's voluntary with community support and input, I guess is the best way to say. Right, and that, that was my other thought was that being landlocked and very few new, new buildings going up, very few new homes going up, uh, you know, how that stretches out to two, 2050, uh, as far as our, our the impact that we have as, as, as what we call growing. Yeah, so uh, ba basically we tried to take that into account when we made this plan. We knew that we were landlocked and there were a lot of things that other communities can do because they have more space and more land we can't do. So that was taken into account. Uh, and that, and that's the other thing I think, I don't know, maybe myself or, or there may be others out there that when you, when you try to group a community like Belfont, what happens around Banner or Spring? They're the ones that are having the industrial areas built. Belfont has very little industrial, if any, in Belfont. Everything is on around Belfont. Manny, do you want to answer that? Because you had a lot of conversations with Ickley about that in town, inbound and out of bound programming. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. So. Um... Well, yeah, you're right that uh, industrial energy, that was one of your lowest sectors for the in, in boundary emissions. Um, sorry, I, I'm a little confused what the question is, to be honest. I'm just wondering where the, where the numbers come from. And, and you know, what, we used to have industry in Baltimore, but we don't anymore. And how much, how much did we drop with the gas roof when like Ciro closed or one company closed and uh, those factories and transplant operating on the river. Do they show up in this at all? They those emissions don't show up in this report because we limited it to scope one, which is only inbound within the borough. If okay. you'd gone to scope two, we could have looked beyond the boundaries. But we're still going to use the same percentages as the state. So if their goal is 80%, Belf wants is 80%. Yes. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. With right. what we can control. It's 80% of what we can control. So um, so it's 80% of scope one. It's 80% of what we, what we input into here already. So it's not 80% of, of a higher scope that would take into consideration consumption of, of, of anything. So we're only doing what we can control within the borough. We're not going beyond the borough bounds. No, I didn't think we were. I just, I was just trying yeah. to put it, get it. So mind. our 80% is a much smaller piece of the pie than say, had we done all of Center County, for example. Right. Other questions? I, I have a question. Go ahead, Doug. How, how closely did you work with the school district or the county? In we, had, we invited, the county was involved in the task force from the beginning. One person? We contacted the planning office and asked them who they wanted to uh, participate. And they gave us their director who has the most the largest oversight for the county in terms of planning. The school board we invited, but they decided not to participate. Any reason why? I don't know. 
Um, and I see some of the goals is EV vehicles and the county has probably 150 vehicles in their transportation system. Uh-huh. Well, I would think they would be a good candidate to, to have involved in this program. Oh, I agree. Uh, well, what happened with that? Well, I'm not sure what your question, what your-, your I, would, your I would reach out to the county and see if they're interested in, in joining with, with, with this other person who has who has been appointed by the county? Um, I think that's a very good idea. Okay. The other no thing was, third was it fifty years from now? We don't know what the administration is going to be in the county, so I don't know how we can count on support dollars fifty years from now. Uh, that's just a comment I have. We current administration we know, and hopefully know what to expect, but three years from now, it could completely change and go the opposite way. That's, that's politics. <laughs> that, that would fall into what you can control. Right. <laughs> uh, I heard somebody else want and wanted to ask a question. I think of any, I, I was in on the original workshop side so and I looked pretty good then. Okay. Uh, Joanne, I'll ask a question. How, considering the goals that are uh -huh. being considered here, how is ARB going to take this and factor all of these, let, let's use the made up word desirements, into what they will allow people to do with a house in uh, the hard disk. Okay, uh, I think we can already partially answer that because when we created the solar panel ordinance, we worked with HARB and we created an ordinance that allows solar energy within the historic district. We can well, do the same. We can do the same thing with uh, other issues, and as technology improves. So for example, the ordinance, the, the solar panel ordinance, solar energy ordinance says that, it, that the panels need to blend in on the main uh, front of, of each building. There are more and more technology now that would actually have solar panels that look like shingles that could be put on and you couldn't tell the difference between that and what a, a shingle would it be on the house. And so they would be perfectly fine to go ahead with that. So we've got in that particular ordinance, we were planning to do work on that. There will be, what other ones come up, we'll have to work with that down the road. Well, I was specifically thinking about, you know, you're, you, you want to have electricity, which means I probably have to put my heat pump somewhere. Uh -huh. On the property. In the yeah. back. In the back. <laughs> is that okay? Is that the plan? That's, yeah, that's, that's allowed. Oh, so street. just for example, I just went through HARB uh, last month and uh, Ralph can um, confirm this. Through an administrative approval, I'm going to be allowed to put solar panel batteries on the back of the house uh, to allow that improved renewable energy. So your heat pump example would be the same sort of uh, uh, administrative approval in most mm -hmm. cases. Okay. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking the question because I'm, uh, if you, um, you will ask sometimes you. you have to put the heat pump where you need to get the in-house unit located. So you can't just put it randomly anywhere on the property. It more or less has to be where it needs to be to feed yeah. the uh, air it's, handler unit. Yeah. So it'll be it'll be an interesting issue for Harb to deal with. Is yeah, to go I agree. Okay. Well, it's it's the same same as uh, like I saw in there where the the goal is to have most residential homes uh, going electric. I assume that was electric heat or electric cooling, whatever, but using more electric and 
my question came to my mind there was, well, will the infrastructure handle that much additional output if their infrastructure is not built up to accept it? You know, how much, how much time do we need to give West Penn Power to improve their distribution in order to add more load to it? Yeah, that's why if you look down under the uh, specific goals and plans that the utility company is added in as one of the lead actors so that we have their input so we know exactly what's happening. We can't answer that question immediately, but they would be part of the lead actors to help us make those decisions. Yeah, I know they do planning and you know, there's areas that they do specify where they're doing projects, uh, but you know, they should be able to share that info with us. I'm just hoping they upgrade the service line in my part of the town so I don't have a weekly or daily outage. <laughs> That's the thing, I have, I have gas heat and I would probably keep the gas heat. I might be able to throw some electric baseboards in, but that I don't know if that would be my main heat source. Well, and, and I would I would argue from some of the things I've read where if you have your gas heat with a uh, uh, a heat pump, you'll actually be the most efficient heating system. So I would say there's probably a little bit of gray area here before you just jump off and say it's going to be all electric. There's going to be- Well, if you look at the, there. yeah, John, if you look at it, it's not saying it's all electric. It's saying moving off of oil to all other, all less uh, gas house, greenhouse gas producing but sources, which could include natural gas. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm just saying Randy, Rand, where Randy's going is exactly, you know, that that's where I've been thinking I'm going for several years is when my furnace dies, it gets replaced with one of these high efficiency systems. And you don't see that in the study. So that's, what, that's why we're asking you to look through this. And if you see something that you think needs to be added, please do so, because I don't want this to be accepted before we have full input and know what the community really wants. Yeah, maybe yeah. another good idea for this committee would be getting some some of these trades involved that uh, do these installations, whether it's heating, cooling, you know, uh, electric services. Most most residents in mm -hmm. Belmont probably have no more than 100 amp entrance, which is what I have. Uh, and for me to do any more, I have you know I have to up that. In fact, I think anytime you you add a an entrance to your home now or building one, you're you're looking at 200 amps maybe 150 minimum. So I do have a question for all of you. We have like three more minutes. Uh, do you want this, your reviews and comments to go to the Environment and Sustainability Committee for one final review before we bring it back to council after you, you make your edits? If so we can, we can do that during the session this evening and then hold off the actual vote until the second meeting in August. Well, I, I would like to see us re review it ourselves, whatever whatever options or. Yeah, that's I said that what that was what I was trying to say. So you all review it first, send it to Mike as chair of the Environment and Sustainability, and then between the uh, first meeting in August and the second, they the Environment can set them and, and kind of compile and put all of that together for presentation at the second meeting in August. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sounds like it does. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Maddie, so much for participating. Thank this you. has been really, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. That was a lot of work. Thank yeah. you. It's been a great year at the task force. Good luck in your everybody. future endeavors and your Thank current you. internship. All right. Bye. 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 So we have one minute and then we'll get started. I will be right back. Me too. Get I'm gonna... order.
are you back? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we can get started. Uh, uh, welcome you all to the uh, July 20th Belfont Borough Virtual uh, Council Meeting. Uh, we'd like to uh, call to order, Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence. And the uh, flag is on Ralph's Square. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There's my gavel. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, my, uh, roll call, it? please. Miss Tosti Vasey. I'm here. Miss Walker. I'm here. Mr. Brackbill. I'm here. Thank you. Miss Cleeton. Here. Mr. Eaton. I'm here. Miss Zamboski. Present. Mr. Johnson. Present. Mr. Prendergast. I'm here. I don't know Ms. what happened. Thompson. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Thompson. Present. Mayor Wilson. I'm here, but I can't see myself. Okay. <laughs> All right, we see you're looking good. <laughs> we can see you. <laughs> um, all those that, uh, that are taken this evening will be recorded as unanimous unless we hear an audible opposition. That way we won't spend a lot of time going through a roll call vote each time. Uh, motion to approve minutes. So moved, Brackville. I'll second. Prendergast. Thank you. Any changes? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Consent agenda, we have nothing. Hallelujah. <laughs> Uh, moving on to communications. Ralph, do you want to start okay. off? Okay. There's a few items. I'll try to be brief. Uh, the first one is just a flyer on land use webinars coming up for later this summer, early fall. The flyer is there for your information. If you're interested in anything, contact me or Kathy in the office and we'll, we'll get you situated. Next item is a request from the Belfont School District in regard to having cross-country practices and meets out at Governor's Park. They would start in August and go through November 1st. The various states are in the letter in your packet looking for approval. Of course, they, mm -hmm. they reference the COVID-19 precautions and all that. I'd like to refer this to Parks and Rec so we can meet with them between now and the next meeting so we can have the same conversation that we've had with all of the other groups that requesting uh, space at Governor's Park. Sounds good. Next. Okay, thank you. The uh, next item is a letter from the YMCA. They would also, or they like to hold a triathlon sort of based in Governor's Park near the pool. It's scheduled for August 15th. It would use adjacent roadways next to Governor's Park, going in and going out to, again, the map and the fine details are in, in your packet. This is something for next year. The letter actually said June 15, 2020. I think they meant 2021. Yeah, I think down the bottom, the second letter below that had that 2021 date. Okay. I'd like to refer this one to uh, the streets for their consideration and recommendation as well. Okay. Next, uh, letter, next item is a letter from Downtown Belfont Incorporated. Uh, they're canceling the, the traditional or formal Belfont under the lights or, uh, event takes place in September, but there's a number of events or a number of uh, requests that they're making in their letter. And I don't know if Alan, Ellen may be on the call. Uh, let me just try to summarize what they're requesting. Use of Tellyram Park 
for two weekends monthly on Fridays and Saturdays to create an outdoor dining space in the Belfont area. Uh, the, the area specifically would be the grassy area in front of the gazebo all the way to High Street or near the bridge. There's a plan that they submitted and you should have a copy of it. They are also interested in, along with the, you know, the dining area, having uh, a, a beverage uh, vendor come in, sort of like they do over at the formal Melfun Under the Lights program, but just one vendor, possibly some food vendors are there as well. There's a whole list of activities or uh, that would go along with the event, the social distancing, the dates are in the proposed uh, letter, July 31st, August 1st, August 14th, 15th, August 28th and 9th and so on. September, there's two weekends they would be looking at. And then they also are interested in permanently installing lights in the area where the Under the Lights program is held or has been held the last couple of years. Uh, I believe that's the gist of the letter and, and the request if you're interested. I'd like to move this into two, two separate issues. The permanent lighting, I would like to have that go to Parks and Rec because that was not discussed at the Parks and Rec meeting last week. So we can have a further discussion, figure out how we can make that happen easily for everybody. The rest of it, we did meet last week. And um, I think we could move ahead for a motion on that. Uh, Gina, do you want to talk about that, or does uh, Melissa, since you were at that meeting Ellen, last week? Ellen's, Ellen's here. I think um, yep. she can jump in. Oh, okay. I didn't see you. Sorry. Go ahead, Ellen. No problem. Um, so I'm actually, uh, we're not planning to permanently install those lights down on the waterfront this year. Um, we're hoping to do the regular temporary installation this year in September like we normally would, um, and hopefully make that a fundraiser to um, secure the funding we need for the permanent installation um, for hopefully next year. Okay, so we can meet with the committee and do some planning for that. Sure, yep. Okay. So we need a motion. Do you, what I'll do is uh, we'll do the motion and then Ellen can have, make any comments and then we could have open for discussion and have a final decision. So the motion is to, con I need someone to conditionally approve the mini under the lights events on July 31st, August 1st, August 14th to 15th and, and 28th to 29th, September 18th to 19th and 25th to 26th with the possibility of October 16th, 17th and the 30th, 31st if the prior events are successful following all masking, social distancing, sanitizing, table setup has agreed to with the parks and rec committee alcohol sales with only one alcohol distributor at a, an event. And uh, conditional approval is also dependent on designating Belfont and reliability insurance policy. I'll make that motion if I don't have to repeat all that. Sure, that's <laughs> from the guest. Second, Hoboski. Okay. Um, Ellen, do you have anything else to say? Yeah, I did just want to add that. Um, so we, we did put this proposal and took it to our board last Monday. Um, and then obviously the governor made some new restrictions on Thursday. So we don't feel that we can hold this event as proposed um, under the new restrictions. However, we are asking for this approval still so that if we were to get a green light um, from the governor, we can still go ahead and hold it. Okay. Okay. So would you be uh, notifying us on a monthly basis to whether that particular set of events will be being held or not so we can let the public know? Yeah, we can definitely do that. I would say um, at this point, there's probably no way the July 31st event would happen, but the hope is that the um, restrictions might ease up for August 14th. Okay. Oh, Ellen, would these... Uh... Would this be a ticketed event? It would not be, no. So we would have only one entrance that would allow us to make sure that, um, well, we're not gonna let it get even close to 250 people, but to ensure that 250 people don't end up in the space. Um, but other than that, it will not be ticketed. 
So how are the uh, craft beverages being monitored? Um, it'll be up to that beverage dispenser. So, um, you know, they have their own license and um, they're kind of in control of the alcohol situation down there. That's why we're only allowing one um, because DBI can't really manage that aspect of it. Um, so um, so we'll, we'll make sure the right people are getting in and out and then it's up to the craft beverage producers to monitor their own sales. The only area... Oh, go on, Randy. I just wonder if they're going to be using bands and yes. in, a, in, a, in an area just for the beverages. Yes. So the uh, what we're asking for is the entire gazebo grass side, similar to what um, the Summer Sounds utilizes. And then in there, there would just be a section that would be roped off for our craft beverage. So it would be highly controlled, like we do for winter market and um, under the lights. Is that, did that give enough space on that side for social distancing? Yes. Okay. It's large. It, you don't think it when you're just thinking about it, but when you're down there, it's we think it's going to be quite large, and um, like we're not interested in having anywhere near the governor's max of people allowed in at one time. We're hoping that they cycle through. If people are down there, they cycle through quickly. So it's not like an all night hangout. Yeah, part of um, you know the, the new restrictions from last week are, is that you, you have to be eating to be drinking a beverage. Um, so that in, kind of ensures that people aren't going to be hanging out. They're probably just gonna grab one beverage and then leave. Any other questions? Well, when you say leave, so do we have a open container law? Well, they won't be leaving with the beverage. They'll be drinking it there. <laughs> oh, okay. And the time is from what? Five to what each evening? That I didn't see in the request. Oh, you know what? Um, I did miss that in my outline. Thank you. Um, I, I believe we were talking about um, 5 to 9.30, which would allow us to clean up by 10. Okay. And will you be cleaning the tables between each person? Yeah, so we're actually only going to have a very limited number of tables, um, probably 10. Um, and then, you know, just encourage people to, to stand or maybe bring a camp chair um, if they'd like to sit in another space. That makes it a little easier for us to clean between people. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll put it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, you got your event, Ellen. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And we'll move and we'll move do the permanent lighting with a meeting with Parks and Rec. Okay, sounds great, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, the next item is a letter from uh, requesting support from CBICC. And we're gonna hold that till later on. Uh, Joanne and part of her report wants to go over discussions about Penn State's uh, reopening or com students coming back. So we're gonna hold that for a moment. The next item is a request for a butterfly release at Talleyrand Park. The request was forwarded from, from Jim Dunn, but it came in from Scott Davidson. I believe Scott is in our meeting virtually. Uh, let me just go over the particulars. Butterfly, butterfly release, they were looking at the date of August 1st. Uh, says the whole program would be less than two hours probably 50 people or less, again, in Talleyrand Park, I believe near the gazebo or near High Street. Yeah. Scott, do you, uh, I called Scott this afternoon and I asked him to come in. But he has some new ideas and wanted to uh, present them this evening uh, before we actually had the motion. All right. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, first, um, with uh, 
Center Home Care, Center Crossings Hospice. We are the longest, oldest nonprofit home health and hospice agency in the county. We actually were uh, based out of Belfont for a very long time. It's actually been around longer than I have been. Uh, at some point in time, we went from having our butterfly release at Talleyrand to Furnace Mansion. I don't know when that happened. Um, Furnace Mansion is having water main problems this year. And that happened after we sent out the invitation. So we're a little scrambling. But uh, my medical secretary said, well, it should go back to Talleyrand where it used to be. It was perfect. So I went and I walked Talleyrand today to, to find exactly where uh, would be the best location. Um, I'm looking at senior citizens, some with walkers, some with wheelchairs. So um, terrain is very important. Uh, on my walk today, uh, I love the spot between the George Gray Bernard uh, Abraham Lincoln bust and the old fountain. It's shaded. There, there are two um, fixed tables, which I love that secures uh, social distancing for two families. The other place I love is right next to my cafe buzz. There's a few, but I, I didn't speak with them. So I would have to get their approval. I would never just show up at your doorstep and surprise anyone. But I think the real spot would be the pollinator garden because it gives me space to social distance no matter how many families we, we have come. Uh, last year, we had 25 people come, three different families. This is not normally a huge event. I also love the pollinator garden because we do release live butterflies. So it would give them a place to, to stop before they, they continue their journey. Um, the one drawback I have about that is shade. Uh, I went today, our, our butterfly release is scheduled for two o'clock. I went today at 1.45, the sun was high. There was a little bit of shade. Um, and of course, I'm at your mercy. If you say, no, this is where you're gonna have it, then I say, thank you very much. Uh, but those are the three locations that I feel would be ideal uh, for this event, if it's approved. If you, went to the, if you went to the pollinator garden, would you be able to put up a tent? I do have an easy up and I would ask to bring that. I would also bring uh, bag chairs. We have some bag chairs that we would clean and take away. Um, with the change of location with the Furnace Mansion water problem, I will have to call all the people that have sponsored butterflies and, and speak with them. So I can tell them bring your own chairs, but I'll probably communicate with them to I, I need to know a number. I can't be shocked when 40 people show up. I'm fine if four people show up, but I, I can't have that surprise of eight different families coming. You know, I have to do masks, everyone with masks, everyone social distancing. We normally have refreshments, but this year's refreshments will be um, bottled water and single packs of cookies that myself and our medical secretary, hospice director will, will um, hand out. It, it won't be a matter of uh, help yourself. And of course, we'll have hand sanitizer uh, for the whole thing. You have a one, two, three order of preference where you'd like to hold it. You mentioned three places. I would say the pollinator. Um, garden only because it's the only place that I can expand. You know, if if I got word that there was three families, then I'd be comfortable next to my cafe buzz. I'd be comfortable um, by the old fountain. But this to me is is a beautiful event that we memorialize lost loved ones. And honestly, I love to see people come. So I don't expect a crowd but I would love to see 10, 15, 20 people. Um, with COVID, I don't think I'll get that. 
but I want to give the folks the opportunity with doing it safely too. Uh, safety's number one above and beyond anything else. So just FYI for your future, for your future reference, for that piece of space next to Cafe Buzz belongs to the borough. It's our sm it's the smallest park in the state. That belongs <laughs> to us, not Cafe Buzz. Well, <laughs> and and I saw the the um, bench with the plaque, so I said, "Ha ha! I'm pretty sure that's not theirs." It's not. But <laughs> at the same time. To me, if I was them, heck, I would love a group of folks to come next to me and release butterflies. I mean, gosh, ice cream. Yeah, yeah. I mean, bring the young ones and hey, let's get some ice cream. Or, boy, it's it's 95 degrees down here. Where can I go to get cold? Right next door. Um, but I would also not want to step on anyone's toes. I would communicate them, and they're not open Monday, so I couldn't even have had a chance to talk with. Now, will these primarily be monarchs that you're releasing? Painted ladies, actually. Okay. Um, huh. The painted ladies are a little bit more um, durable, as I understand it. Okay. And the monarchs, with their migration, uh, they're very specific with their migration. Right, right. That's why I was, yeah. So okay, it, it's thank painted you. ladies. Okay. And that only took me 10 years to realize because <laughs> I thought they were monarchs. And then finally speaking with the, the suppliers, they're like, no, no, they're painted ladies. And I said, okay, um, I don't know butterflies. So <laughs> they're fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So what we would need is a motion to conditionally approve the butterfly release on August 1st at the pollinator garden from 2 to 3 p.m with required masking for everyone, marking of the six foot social distancing between family group and obviously limiting access to less than 250 people, which is our- I'll safe. make the motion. Okay. Second. And also they will hand out refreshments. They will not be um, having people come up and stand in line. And jo Joanne? Yeah? If, if they're, say it's incredibly hot or something and they choose to go over to the to the other side of the park where they have some shade are the we going to make, garden yeah are we going to make them uh, there's no reason they have to come back for no they, no okay good so Thank basically you. kind of amend the motion to say that if too hot can move over to the sculpture garden yeah. certainly Thank you. Thank you very much. And to be yeah, clear, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Doug's got something to say. Uh, could uh, could we offer them some free parking um, by the cafe buzz? Maybe a couple spaces we could reserve for them for two hours. Um, would that be doable? Well, uh, some folks who may need some parking close by, could we bag the meters for a couple hours? Just suggesting it. Sure. Sure. I, 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 the, I, the only problem with doing that, Doug, is if they're over at the pollinator garden and they have someone who uses a wheelchair or a walker, they don't have a real problem getting over to the pollinator garden. They would be having- It's more likely that they'll park. Sorry. Yeah. You're right, Gina. They would be if parking- If they're gonna park, yeah, next to the pump house. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, and that's parking lot. Yeah, by the, by the big spring pump house. Yeah. Okay. The, if if there's an overflow, he could always get in touch with uh, JJ Powell. There is little or no activity at the subway building. That maybe that's if there's overflow needed, you might want to contact them and see if they would allow allow you a couple hours there. Thank they you. could also park by uh, Big Spring Spirits and walk over through there. There is a walkway. Yeah. Railroad. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this is quite a journey, but yeah. True. But and you can offer, you don't have to mandate it. You don't have to say, this is where you have to park. You can say, you know, we have these spaces that you can use without paying, but you don't have to. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. This was so, so concerned talking, about making sure they had all, all had access. Sure. We're talking about a Saturday, right? Uh, yes. 
Oh, okay. So we don't charge for parking on Saturday, do we? Uh, we, we, do have it, we do have it posted, but you know, the enforcement officer is there just in the morning, so you're probably okay. Oh, okay. okay. I didn't know we charged on Saturday morning. I'm sorry. Got to read the meters. <laughs> okay. That's the problem with walking. <laughs> so uh, the motion is August 1st, 2 to 3 o'clock at the pollinator garden with a black up at the sculpture garden, masking, six foot social distancing, sanitizing as, as necessary, and uh, the group giving out their refreshments rather than having people stand in line. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Great. You got your event, Scott. I thank you all so much. I really do appreciate it. You're going to make my medical secretary so happy. She <laughs> gave me a 15 minute lecture of how Talleyrand was perfect, always was, and I, you made her happy. Thank you all very, very much. And stay cool. Don't forget to hydrate, wash your hands, and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Moving on. Okay, moving on. The next item for written communications is uh, we received the liquid fuel, or we call it highway aid audit for 2019. And this was done by the Auditor General's office. And it's a pretty good audit, but we wanted you to take a look at it. It's in there for your review. Uh, the Honestly. next. Wait a minute, I want to say thank you so much to Lori. It yes. was a, not only was it a good audit, it was a perfect audit. They found nothing wrong with this uh, part of our budget Absolutely. and the way it was handled. So thank Absolutely. you, Lori, for all the good work you did. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, fund to manage. So Lori did an excellent job with that. Uh, the next item is an email request from Future Stars Tournament Baseball. It's uh, from Anil Weber. Uh, he he's is online, he's here. Okay. Yep, uh, you know, but he's basically the owner and I'll just turn it over. He can summarize the request. Thank you guys for, for having me. And I, and I apologize that uh, you don't see my video. I'm actually on the road. I had a little schedule change to get on the call. So are you, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. We can yep. hear you. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. So my name is Neil Weber, and I am one of the owners of Future Stars Tournament Baseball. We are located in Hershey, Pennsylvania, um, not too far. We have, um, over the past six years, run a youth baseball tournament in the state college area, and we've actually used Governor Park for many, many years um, with the assistance of Joe Mena. Um, this year, our, our dates are August 1st and 2nd. And we are requesting to um, rent the field on Saturday and Sunday, August 1st and 2nd. Um, I believe the tentatively, it looks like it'll be the age group of 16 year olds, 16 U. We typically play four games on Saturday and three games on Sunday. Our uh, games are not to exceed two hours in limit. Um, we've been able to run many tournaments down in the Hershey and, and Ocean City, Maryland area so far with Corona, uh, the, the COVID-19 situation. We started running our first tournament shortly after Father's Day with a lot of uh, procedures and precautions in place from signage to, to spectators to hand sanitizing to umpires not umpiring behind catchers. I don't know how familiar you guys are with baseball, but uh, umpires are now behind the pitcher's mound calling the balls and strikes so that they're not close to the catchers. Um, we have we have signage up and it's it's been going very, very well um, in our area down in, in the uh, Harrisburg Hershey area. So our request would be to um, to see if we could use Governor Park on August 1st and 2nd. So, uh, yeah, I talked to Neil this afternoon. For those who didn't look at his and they were here to link to their websites, COVID-19 um, plans. They were very, very detailed. There were only a couple of things that uh, didn't quite jive with the uh, guidelines put out on uh, baseball. So he and I talked and um, as a result of that, and 
uh, the, the motion would be to uh, conditionally approve uh, the future uh, STARS tournament on August 1st and 2nd from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. on um, both August 1st and 2nd with the following conditions, 15 to 20 minutes between each game, only half of the team allowed in the dugout area, properly social distanced with the other team members seated in chairs, socially distanced behind the dugout. Uh, they want to do a sales, so those sales items may be set up if they, if the masking of the salespeople and customers occurred following again the social distancing and they will follow all of their COVID-19 guidelines as outlined on their website. Uh, if equipment is borrowed from another en entity, which they are requesting, this equipment is to be sanitized be re before returning it to the owners. Uh, coordinating any games with other groups already scheduled, but I don't think there are any. Uh, payment of the daily, daily registration fee, and if needed, payment to repair the ball field, uh. which occurs. And finally, designating golf on the on the liability. Who would like to make that motion? So I'll move, Chambosky. Okay. I'll second. Chambosky and Prendergast. Um, Neil, do you have anything else to say before we have discussion from the group? Uh, no, the only the only thing I one one topic I'd like to mention is is Joe Mena has offered to be the field director who has worked on Governor's Park for many many years. He will also be scheduling all of the umpires. So we're using local uh, center county umpires for the event, and Joe is in charge of not only the field but also scheduling and assigning umpires as well. That's fine. You have a okay. problem with that. <laughs> Just wanted to mention that. Okay. Uh, questions? Uh, John Eaton? Yeah. Uh, Neil, what's the uh, entrance fee for teams at this age bracket? This age bracket, I believe, is six, $695 per team. Okay. And we'll have eight teams on the first day and six teams um, on four, the second four, four teams total four teams total okay four, four teams total for the entire bracket yeah okay yep you know, i assume that they'll have the uh proper verbiage in there considering the COVID 19 and any changes that might occur uh before august if any, uh, hopefully it goes you know, the other way rather than the way it's gone. Uh, as we've done another request for the right. issue. So. so basically, Neil, what uh, Randy is saying is that if we should have to go back to yellow, this whole deal is off. Uh, completely understand. Absolutely. Johnson, in years past, how did we handle this? Uh, he said that we've had this for six years. I, I, this is the first I've heard of it. How did we handle it last year? My my knowledge, as far as how Future Stars handled it, everything went through uh, Joe Mena as far as reserving the field, and um, we would I believe we just paid the the rental fee to Joe. Um, I guess I don't know if it was the Belfont Baseball Group or or what was was paid. I don't know who took the uh, the entry fee, but Joe reached out to me and said this year um, there's some changes and the, the borough will be the, the deciding factor as well as who you would pay for, to rent the field. Didn't we have field rental in last year? Yes. Well, I didn't see no, it. No, we didn't. Uh, just no, we just did. implemented it here a few months ago. Oh, okay. So where does that money go? It'll go into Parks and Rec's budget. Be in years past. We never received any funding from any any uh, field usage in the past.
I'd say it's great. Any other questions? Not I. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, Anil, you got your event unless we go backwards. Understood. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Thanks. All right, moving on. Next item is just a note that Governor Wolf's administration announced, you know, targeted mitigation efforts in response to the COVID-19 increase in cases. It's there in your packet. Again, I'm not going to take time to review it. I'm sure everybody's heard it on the news. It really re uh, relates to bars and restaurants primarily, but it's there for your review. Two things. For those in the public who want to know more about it, if they haven't already heard, if they go to governor.pa.gov and put the word mitigation in the search box, the first thing that will show up after you press the enter button is this uh, mitigation plan. The other thing is I would like to see if it's at all possible, but based on the increasing number of COVID-19 issues that are impacting the borough and our businesses and residents, I wonder if we could create a COVID-19 drop-down section on our website and put all of these posts related to COVID-19 there so that uh, the public knows what our policies are, what the resolutions surrounding COVID-19 and any other community information to help educate the public about this that we would have. I think that might be quite helpful. We, we, we have early on, you know, had links to the governor's website or the right. state website, county website. I think that's where the information should be and is. No, what I'm, Ralph, what I'm saying is that we've got We've had our emergency declaration. Sure. We have our masking resolution. Mm -hmm. There may be other issues that might be come up. If we could just have them in one place instead of on the front page that scroll down and disappear, I think that would be helpful. All right, we'll try and do that. Any other written communication? Yes, the one that I sent out today it came in over the weekend is from the Center County Commissioners. And I was mentioned briefly in the work sessions called the, well, the commissioners are basically, I'm summarizing, saying that they're going to pass a resolution on July 28th in regard to a, a state program called the Commercial Property Ass Assessed Clean Energy Financing Program or c dash PACE program, and it sounds like it's pretty much a real estate uh, tax credit for commercial properties uh, in the county, and uh, there'll be more information coming, but anybody interested can go to www.pennsylvania, C is in cat, P is in Paul, A is in Arthur, C is in cat, E is in Edward, dot org to find out more about this CPACE program. So I just wanted to summarize the letter that came in. Again, the commissioners are going to approve a resolution on July 28th. So just as a side, going back to our climate action plan, this kind of program and resolution that the county does could be considered as part of our climate action plan as it impacts our borough. So when you're looking at the uh, plan, if you want to include that where you think it's appropriate in the different uh, areas, that might be helpful. Anything else? I believe that's all under written communications. Okay. And then we move to oral public comment. Now, there's anybody that wants to make public comment? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And moving on to special committee reports. We just have the comparison of the monthly code statistics for June 2020. And then uh, later on, we made a, uh, an error in the line item. The fire executive report should be under special committee reports. And I believe uh, that would be Randy. Yeah, that uh, I, I'll just give a quick uh, talk to Chief Moore. 
today uh, the email uh, that meeting's canceled for this Thursday. Okay. We got a meet, meeting with the individual chiefs. So he didn't get some information back that he had asked for last week. So it's possible that in August that would also be a a chief's work session, and that may end up being a fire exec meeting uh, to make up for some of the meetings that we've missed. Because we are getting into the budget at this point. That's all I have. All righty. Okay. So we're done with special committee reports? Yes. Okay. Mayor Wilson, you're on. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, just a couple items here. Uh, the first one is uh, Governor Wolf signed the uh, first two law enforcement reform bills and uh, just been you know, a good bit of publicity on that. Uh, there's uh, a complete listing of the bill, what it covers, and that's all can be seen. If you have uh, further interest in knowing the details, you can get that at governor.pa dot gov that's governor dot pa dot gov that'll give you all the skinny that you need on that particular item um i'd like to just uh point out that uh our fireworks ordinance is uh, i had i had hoped and brought to council about a year ago that we um ban fireworks from the borough uh, I think it was decided at that point we already had an ordinance and that was fine. Uh, last night we had a huge display of fireworks. Looked like the Undines were doing their normal fireworks display. Uh, Mike Pendergrass can attest to this as well because this display took place right next to the uh, Methodist Church in downtown uh, on Spring Street in a backyard. Um, it went on for probably 15, 20 minutes. Uh, I went to the location and had an interaction with the people there and explained to them, even though they said their fireworks were legal, I said they are legal, but they're not legal to be set off in the borough at this time. Uh, of course, I got, got a lot of kickback from everybody and um, I did meet with the chief today and talk to him about uh, having his officers be a little more attentive to illegal fireworks uh, in the borough. And uh, last night's display was, um, like I said, it was, it was large and long, and it has the potential to catch one of our buildings on fire. So I think we need to look a little more seriously at this in the future and either decide to ban it completely or not, or if not, we're, we're going to have people just setting them off all year long, and we are going to have a fire, and then it's going to be on us. Um, I think that's about it. We're going to cover something else that Ralph and I had talked about, and Joanne's going to address, and I think one of her um, presentations here as council president. So I'll wait till then to discuss uh, that particular issue. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments? Um, did you just say, did you say it was Undines or were both stations involved? No, no it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, it looked like the Undine Fire Company's display when they used to do them up in the field. I mean, these were, these were large fireworks that went up over the sky and lit up. I mean, I saw the reflection from my window in the Temple Court building, so I knew it was in town. Oh, so um, it wasn't, it wasn't fire department related no no no, no, no. one exactly. fire department later it was a okay, private okay. That's, citizen that's what i heard you say and that was no no i just i was trying to explain the 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 uh, enormity of this uh event it took on it, it started about uh 20 minutes till 10 and ended around 10 o'clock when i went down and talked with them and this is the third one I've interceded on, and I don't want to do it anymore. And it's because at 10 o'clock, we have no police officers on duty uh, on Sundays. No Belfont police officers. And I wasn't going to call the state police in on it. So uh, I'm looking to draft a, a letter to uh, the three places where I had to do an intervention and just uh, advise them of our ordinance our existing ordinance anyhow that's legal on 4th of July and New Year's, that's it. Maybe we ought to uh, 
look at not that legality. <laughs> Maybe we should eliminate that altogether. Well, that's what I talked about it about a year ago, and everybody said, well, we already have an ordinance. So. Yeah, I remember. I want to rethink it. That's all I'm saying. I agree that this year has been worse than previous years. I think everyone's at home and bored, and um, it's it was like every single night in the beginning of July. Yeah, we're well, the, police, the police station's been getting calls. I've been getting phone calls, and uh, and if you don't uh, if you don't think this is a problem, I'll just give them your phone number and they can call you. <laughs> can we raise the Thanks, fine God. in our fee schedule? Can we? Is there a well, one, is there a fine? Two, can we move it to the fee schedule and bump it up so it has like a little bit more of a deterrent to it? Well, can, I, if, if, Ralph, if, you may be able to tell. Go ahead, Ralph. I just wanted to add you can always make an ordinance more strict, not less strict. What we talked about a year or two ago, the state had increased the amount of fireworks that were legal. And that did raise some eyebrows back then. And they have a setback or distance which it, it would not work in the borough. So it, in essence, I think where we left off was 90% 90, 90 of the locations would not be legal in the borough because they're too close to a house or residence. I think we should get our hands on that ordinance, review it, look at it and consider making it more restrictive if needed. But I, we could get a copy and put it in the next uh, council packet. Well, I think along with that, Ralph, is uh, I think the we as the borough uh, have a responsibility to try to educate our uh, citizens on what some of the ordinances are in town. And I'm not sure how, how to do that exactly, but everybody that I talked with were, at least they claimed they were unaware that there was an ordinance uh, for setting off fireworks in the borough. Well, so I don't know how we get the word out, but. I think it's intentional ignorance. They don't want to know. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's hard to tell. Well, Mayor, it's a little bit like when the policeman asked you, do you know how fast you were going? <laughs> yeah. Of yeah. course you don't know how fast you were going, because if you did, you admitted fault. So I I agree. Yeah, let, let's get the ordinance and make sure. So, it, maybe so this it's sounds like an ad hoc committee review. Yeah. Did you just put that on safety for public safety? Yeah, why don't we put it yeah. there? Let's go to safety. I'll be glad to help you with that too, uh, yeah. whoever's on. Uh, so Randy, you're on safety. So yeah, you have a I meeting think, right now. I personally think it should be a fairly easy fix. Just yeah, I think so too. And, uh, well, I, 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 I've asked, to have, I've asked to, sorry, I've asked to have all the phone numbers of the Police, the cell phone numbers of police officers that are on during the evening so I can contact them immediately um, for them to go out and intervene because I don't think it's my job to intervene. I don't have enough body armor. You're the mayor. Yeah, I am invincible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. I'm done. Any other questions for the mayor? Okay. So I'm next. Um, so what I wanted to do before we looked at the CBICC letter is to report on a meeting I attended with Penn State University on July 9th so that you all know what the university is planning on reopening. And then we can look at the CBICC letter and determine how we want to handle it. Um, um, at that meeting on July 9th, President Barron stated that the PS Penn State University will have a, what the, he's calling a hybrid mixture of classes. Some of them will be in person, some will be remote, some will be a combination, and that every class will go remote after the Thanksgiving break to reduce the possibility of new infections upon return of students for the end of the fall semester. They also said that uh, sports will be limited to playing other teams within the Big Ten so far as he knows right now, that only affects football, uh, but that may change. They haven't decided about spectators yet. Then uh, the vice president for student affairs, uh, Damon Sins came on and he said that they're working with CBICC and State College in a move on plan to maximize COVID-19 and 
to the county with returning students. And what it sounded like to me is they're going to bring, bring in groups of students in one week, a certain amount, they handle all of those, then the next week they bring in another. So some of them will be coming in a little earlier, some will be coming in a little later, so that they have, so that they're not having 40,000 uh, students to send all at once on um, the university and causing some social distancing and uh, other issues trying to get into their dorms or their apartments. Uh, in order to return to school, the students will have to sign an agreement to follow all of the COVID-19 guidance. Uh, this includes what he, the way they put it, stay well, stay six feet apart, six feet apart, stay masked, and stay home if sick. Home meaning your dorm or your uh, apartment, unless you've been diagnosed with COVID, and then they're going to put you into quarantine in which uh, they will have uh, Food, nursing, um, what was the other one? Uh, social distancing and assistance with classes while you can't get out of the room because you're in quarantine for two weeks. Um, the fraternities will be prohibited from having socials. Uh, the Office of Social Outreach is developing targeted messages uh, that once developed, they'll test us to make sure that students who normally don't want to follow uh, messaging will see what works best to have them follow along. And then Matt Farah uh, talked about uh, uh, contact tracing and uh, how they will be using it. He said that if a person and so they would, how they would combine that with testing and, and, and asymptomatic individuals. He went into great detail. I don't think we need to do that here this evening. There were two questions that were asked after the presentation. I think that there were many more than that, but I think there are two that, uh, that we should be in a concern then. One of the questions is what happens if a person refuses to wear a mask and what are the consequences? Um, that we were told that PSU will provide a mask for people to wear if they don't have one. Employees will be reminding others to mask. Uh, if a student does not wear a mask or refuses, they will be referred to judicial affairs if they continue to refuse. And the sanctions will be ratcheted up to and including suspension if needed. Uh, for off-campus violations, they will be relying on citations under uh, State College's proposed masking ordinance that, that will be voted on at their first meeting in August. As we said before, State College is a home rule community with a health department, and as such, they will be able to, uh, to uh, enforce uh, governor's mandated masking should they that be necessary. There's also other things in that ordinance that uh, is still being written, including things about forming lines in town to help keep the social distancing going on. The other question was, how will games be played at the state stadium? So far, um, there will be no tailgating. Uh, they're reducing the number of inspections, so spectators allowed, uh, but they haven't given how many and there will be social distancing requirement. This is work, being worked out with the Big Ten uh, Commission. And so they're going to make it the same for all Big Ten universities. So until that thing is filed, we don't have much more detail on that. Uh, tag, tag, yeah. on, tagging on to what you said, Joanne, I uh, just want to let everybody know um, about a week ago, I, I got to receive the phone call um, with uh, from Vernon Squire from CBICC um, telling me uh, what the plan is. It, it apparently is uh, Tom Fontaine from State College is crafting an ordinance that will have uh, some enforcement power with it. And um, what they're asking is, uh, well, here's the bottom line. The, the battles are going to be fought in downtown State College with the students at the bars. So I suggested that he contact the Tavern Association to make sure that all, all the owners are on board and are monitoring 
their taverns to be in compliance because the uh, most of the citizens of State College and, and the area are concerned with the return of the students. Obviously, the CBICC wants the students to come back because of uh, you know, the economic uh, value of having those returned students, but we want, to re want them to come back and comply. So they're writing an ordinance. Now, they're not acting on their ordinance until the day after we have our next meeting. Uh, I talked with Ralph about this after we get a hold of Tom Fontaine so that we can look at their ordinance uh, that they're writing. We can review it prior to our next meeting and decide if we want to enact a similar ordinance. And the reason being, hold on, Joanne. The okay. reason being is that we're being asked to be consistent with the enforcement of this ordinance because if we're not consistent, the students will understand that they're being stepped on in State College and they're gonna to come to Spring Township, they're gonna to come to Belfont, and we don't live in a bubble as we have already talked about. So they're looking for consistency in the ordinance and consistency in enforcement. Whether I agree with that or not is another issue, but that's what's being asked and that's what we need to consider as a council, whether we wanna enact that uh, ordinance one, Tom, we lost you. Yeah, we lost him. Yeah, do we have, and I lo we lost me earlier. There he is. Enforce it. Pardon? Do we have authority to enforce it? Well, I would, we're going to we're gonna look at that, it. Mike. It's got to go to our solicitor. Yes. I have already talked to uh, um, our district attorney, and he's, uh, he's not real happy about it because it's going to put the police in a position of confrontation with students, which is never a good thing. So once we get the ordinance, because State College, correct me if I'm wrong, is a uh, home rule run a little different uh, types of uh, uh, guidelines. So we have to get the ordinance and then have our solicitor review it to see if it's enforceable in our burden. Yeah. And Spring As Township is doing the same. I think I think we we have to be very diligent on this part because, as I understand it, we we're under the uh, uh, different rules than state home rule communities, right. and we also and so because we don't have a health department within the borough, we don't I'm have not a health sure. department within the county, and we don't have one within the county. Right. State College has a health department, which is. One one of the reasons why they can actually enforce this ordinance. I think we need to check with our solicitor to see if it's possible at all. Right. I'm, That's all I'm, I'm saying. I'm not yeah. saying. I'm not advocating. I'm just saying these are the steps that we need to take. I, so, I, go ahead, John. I just don't see. I don't see State College on a Saturday night sending a an enforcement officer into the various venues in State College or in College Township, Hatton or any of the others mm -hmm. to prevent what we're watching occur from Florida to Arizona to California. Are you saying you don't think it can happen? I don't think it can happen. I think it's gonna be the same I think it's cluster it that's occurring in the southern part of the country right now. And well, I think that I think that's what they're anticipating, but I think that's why they're trying to put some teeth into an ordinance. But I'm just and saying, bear, and this, and sorry, Tom, to cut you off, but that's okay. When we were in the in the meeting or listening in on the conference call with Darren, he was very frank on the fact that he has minimal or no ability to enforce the behavior of the students once they leave Penn State campus. That's why, the, that's why they're asking the town to do it. We, we can try, but we're not going to go inside any business establishment and tell a businessman that he has to enforce a code of conduct. I, I doubt that that's going to happen. I'll interject. Uh, Center Region Code has the authority 
uh, to shut down business if they're if they are over the level of people allowed in the building. And that's yeah. what happens. That has happened in the past. That that, has but that doesn't have anything to do with mass. Well, well, well there are several. There are several businesses in downtown State College who are not complying with the number of people. They're not complying with the 25% nor with the 50%. So that's going to help with that part of it, at least. Uh, this is not the hill I want to die on. I don't know that it's, you know, it's going to be State College's problem, but I don't want to see it become our problem when the students get run out of State College because of the pressure put on there, if it even happens at all. Well, what would it, probably it, help is if Penn State would say, if you are, uh, he's from them, that they get, expel the student or something. Is there some uh, suspend them or some ramification that if they go to an outside town and it gets back to them that there's some disciplinary action? People asked that of Barron and he, in, in a roundabout way, and he said, no, I can't okay. do that. So, yeah, I'm hearing Belf Belfond, I'm hearing Spring Township, and we're talking about State College, but I think we're also talking about the township surrounding State College. You have students that live in State College, they're not on campus, they live outside State mm -hmm. College Borough. And I don't hear anything about Patton, I don't, you know, or any of the townships outside of State College. Are they involved in this discussion as well? Because they have, yeah. they have, you know, they're, they're the ones who are going to be having the parties. Yeah, they've been every every t township and the borough of State College and surrounding townships and borough of Belfont and Spring, who has the police department, has been asked to try to have some consistency with enacting and possibly enforcing this if it's legal for us to do. So there are some steps. Right. You know, it's not even positive that all the students are coming back yet, regardless of what's been said. I, I have some inside information that says they're still teetering on this whole thing. Well, you have to do the positive things too. You got to put up the signage, what you're, you know, to let people know what, if they're coming down to Belfont, they're going to see signage. This is required, you know, something about the mask and things like that as reminders, uh, the social distancing reminders, but they know uh, when they, if they do that and they obey it, there's no issues. But if they're, just, yeah, if they're just coming down just because they couldn't do it in State College, doesn't mean they can come and do it in Belfont, but I think we have to be positive about it and, and possibly have to put, put the notifications out there so people know that, you know, we're serious about trying to uh, keep this thing in, in pack. Well, we also have to enforce it on our own citizenry. So let me let me add a little bit of information. Uh, last Thursday, I received an email from Carl Somerson, who's the senior attorney for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission regarding uh, ADA guidelines for uh, mandatory masking. Uh, is basically tells businesses, employers, and educational facilities, what can and can't be done in terms of mandating masking and what kind of questions can be asked. I forwarded that on to Ralph, Don, Sean, uh, DBI, uh, the um, Chambers of Congress, Chamber of Commerce here in town, as well as CBICC and every other Chamber of Commerce and municipality for whom I had a, an email with on Friday so that that information could be, get out to the townships and the communities. And if anyone is listening and they didn't get it, get hold of me and I'll send that to you through my other hat uh, as chair of the Senate County Advisory Council for the Human Relations Commission. I think that might help a little bit with this educational piece about what businesses can and can't do. I don't know how far it will go, but at least it gives more information about what's legal and what's not legal. But Joanne, is it anything different than what's been in Dr. Levine's direction that any of the grocery stores will quote to you when you yes. ask? Yes, 
It is. There is something different there? Yes, it basically says uh, that uh, if you're an essential business, you can't ask the person uh, what the uh, thing, their, their problem is. However, you can prohibit them entering without a mask and offer them alternative methods to get their essential services. Well, that, that, that would be a little bit different because previously the state guideline was you, 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 you could not ask them to identify what the medical they, condition was. They, don't, they still don't have to identify what it is. But if they make a positive statement that they have a medical disability that doesn't allow them to have a mask, then the essential services, the grocery stores, the drug stores, can say, okay, uh, here, are my, here are the alternatives that we can offer to help make this for you to get your essential services. Things like doing the grocery shopping for them, helping them order online, uh, free, uh, there was just five or six things. It's a very detailed four page uh, list of suggestions. Having an earlier time for people who have these things that they would be the only ones in the store. Those are the sort of uh, accommodations that can be made. Uh, maybe Ralph, what you might wanna do is send this out to council so that they could see what these are. It's, I think it was, it was quite helpful. And I know that uh, BBI and uh, the Chamber of Commerce is distributing them to their businesses here in town. I'll send them out. Thank you, Ralph. Sure. Okay. Can we move on to the Spring Creek watershed? Well, no, we no, we still have to go back to the request from CBICC. Uh, there are two ways to handle their request. One is either to have a motion to sign on to their letter, which is basically a full opening with no uh, mitigation, or we could write our own letter to PSU. Uh, to encourage them to reopen in based on their guidelines, which is basically a more of a balanced act than what the CBIC letter is saying. So well, it's up to been, you. We've been asked to write a letter. Yes. We, we've been asked to write our own letter uh, encouraging Penn State to reopen with strict mitigation and a, um, a commitment to enact our own ordinance and provide uh, enforcement. I don't know if we're ready to do that yet. Yeah, I, all I can say is I, I, I really, I can't vote for that CBCI letter. I, uh, I find that actually embarrassing, the content of it saying we are so rabid for the money from the students that we are willing to take a risk. I mean, that was sort of like, let's play Russian roulette. I cannot support that. So I'll make a motion that we, uh, the Belfont formulates their own letter in support of Penn, Penn State's reopening under their guidelines. I would second that. Black Bill and Prendergast. Um, discussion? I can't, I think, John, because John, it, I, but, uh, that letter was a little off. I thought it was yeah. inappropriate. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm good with what, Ra I'm good with what Randy proposed and I, I'm, I'm good with I'm, I'm ready to call the question if everybody's okay with it. Yeah, I, I want to make one statement before. I agree with it. I don't think the CBIC letter is appropriate. I think with what we, I presented based this evening, if we can incorporate some of that material, my notes that I presented to, in our letter so that we work very clear as what it is we want to see 
happen with the university, I think that would be appropriate. Agreed. Which is why I asked this to be held off until after we had that presentation. Any other comments? Seeing none, all in favor of Randy's motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Uh, Ralph, I can send you my notes and then uh, that can help you write the letter. Thank you. Okay, next is the Spring Creek Watershed Commission. Uh, it was held last week on July 15th. There were the, the major outcome of that that I think you'd be interested in is that the water one water report the presentation to uh, municipalities is delayed due to a glitch with the people who are trying to create the presentation the executive committee is going to be meeting in august to look to see it next step so we'll know after that meeting in august what's going to be happening with it so right now it's on hold so that's the report for the spring creek watershed commission in terms of the Drive Electric PA Coalition, that one was held on July 16th. The first half of the meeting discussed light and heavy duty electric vehicle trucks that could be used by municipalities. The second half of the meeting focused on what's happening here in Pennsylvania in terms of economic growth and jobs. The one thing I think that you uh, should might be interested in is that on August 6th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the Electrification Coalition is holding a PA EV policy boot camp for citizens, council members, MPOs, and dealerships uh, on electric vehicle policy. The boot camp is part of the uh, coalition state policy acceleration program that is working with five states, uh, including Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, and Virginia, on a two-year effort to encourage greater EV adoption. The morning session is they're calling EV 101, which will feature experts in national and energy security, air pollution impacts, and vulnerable communities. Uh, the afternoon session will focus on the policies needed to put the, as they said, the pedal to the metal. Uh, they will be joined by state agency leaders from other states that have adopted policies on EV in order to hear about what lessons learned and best practices. These panelists that they're, they've already announced include uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection Secretary, Patrick O'Donnell, and Admiral Dennis C. Blair, uh, Navy, U.S. Navy retired, who's the former Director of National Intelligence and Commander Chief of the U.S. Pacific Command. He's going to be talking about the uh, um, these security issues related to energy production and why moving over to EV vehicles might be a good, good plan. If you're interested, uh, you can go to bit.ly, B-I-T period L-Y slash P-A-E-V camp. And there's a registration form there. Joanne, if you send that to me, I'll send it out to everybody. Okay. Also included in the next packet. Okay. okay thank you. Okay, we'll do. That's my reports. All righty. Move in the city reports. Ann Walker, you're on first with building and property. Okay, um, on July 29th, the building and property committee, committee will meet to discuss the kiosk locations at um, the Spring Street parking lot. And are we still going to be talking about the YMCA, something about their parking? Yeah, I think so. While we're meeting, we'll try to get that addressed as well. Okay. That's staff parking for the public. Yeah. Right, right. That's what I have. Any questions for Anne? Okay, moving on to Gina and finance and government performance. Uh, finance committee met last week, I believe, and we uh, primarily just discussed the furlough program um, and kind of what we 
learn from that and how to move forward from that and um, kind of ways to improve that should we need to approach it again. Any questions for Gina? Next, uh, Melissa Parks and Rec. Our committee met last week on the 14th. We met, uh, first we met at Governor's Park with Kevin Lloyd to discuss plans for the drive-in. And uh, our committee feels that our concerns have been covered and we would like to proceed. So I ask that council considers approving the, uh, the uh, movement, the moving of the drive-in from the armory to Governor's Park um, for, with the provision that insurance is provided and all applicable guidelines set forth by the CDC and Governor's Office are covered. I'll second, Brackbill. Senator Tom Bosky and Brackbill. Do you wanna get the dates? Uh, I believe we already approved the dates. I do not have them in front of me. Uh, 31st, the weekend of the 31st of July, I believe is a Friday. And then of course, Friday and Saturday. And then I think we're looking at the Friday before Labor Day, like the 4th of September or something like that. Friday and Saturday. Yes, the uh, it would be when under the lights traditionally would be at September 4th and 5th. Okay. Discussion? Tom, you're talking, but we can't hear you. There there we go. Go. Uh, I think I know, I'd heard where in Governor's Park, but I don't remember if you could just tell me where, where in Governor's Park would this be? Um, near the baseball field where the temporary soccer goals are placed. Uh, right next to where the batting cage is. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. So I think, a, I think that's a good location. The screen will uh, run parallel to the tree line in the hopes that there's more cover from wind. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Thank you. And and they're planning on doing it with cars. If the ground's mushy, then they will have people in chairs with social distancing and we would be limiting it to 250 people maximum. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, unanimous. Continue, Melissa. After that meeting, we um, drove down to socially distance. We all drove down to the <laughs> little pocket park on High Street, the high, it's currently called the Railroad and High Street Park. Next to my bus cafe, we met with Ellen Mattis from DVI, who was on earlier to discuss um, a joint cooperation between the borough and DVI to uh, beautify that park, add some planters, um, maybe do some landscaping, and add a community bulletin board. Um, we decided to move forward with an MOU with DVI um, to iron out some details. Uh, it will be in conjunction with feedback from uh, CEDACOG about setbacks from railroads and PARB to discuss what would um, be appropriate for a bulletin board. They'll also talk with my buzz. So there's a cooperation there and that they understand that they're allowed to access the space if they need to do so. And, and, and work with the design committee at DBI uh, for the design of the, the yes. design. We need a motion for that, or are we? We just need to wait until we get that MOU before we do anything. Okay. That's just required at this point. Okay. Um, directly after that, when we disbanded, there was a bit of uh, drama. You guys missed it. The rest of the Perks Committee. Um, there was a uh, emergency duckling rescue on high on Water Street, where a woman scooped up about seven ducklings in a plastic bag and reunited with the mother there was a water weasel involved and it was very dramatic <laughs> i can tell you that all in a night where we have more time 
Um, but I'd <laughs> like to thank local resident um, Tori Ballinger for saving about seven or eight ducklings and reuniting with the mom. Thank it's you. a wild ride. <laughs> Any statement? Anything else, Melissa? One more thing. I've been meaning to show this during council, and I don't know if it'll be reversed or not. But this is the brick. This is an example of the brick that will be installed with the Talleyrand Park Committee in um, Talleyrand Park near the observation of the waterfall. If you would like to purchase a brick for yourself, it's one hundred and fifty dollars, and you can go to um, TalleyrandPark.org to purchase that. It's a nice paver. It's very nice. It came out really nice and um, hopefully they will be installed sometime. COVID blessed. <laughs> can we see anything we want to put that on the paper? website, that announcement of where people can purchase can we put that information on our website or is it for purchasing that for it? Um, are you asking Ralph if it can be added to our website? We can do that. Um, yes, and uh, I can ask for, or maybe we can post like a PDF of the okay. form that you fill out. Sure. Um, and if any council members are interested, I can send you the form directly. That'd be good. Okay. Anything else? Pretty cool about that for the Gazette a few months ago, and you can link to that too if you like. It. Oh, that's a great idea, Anne. Um, I don't believe I have anything further unless Don would like to update about the um, bridge project. Uh, they're, very, they're moving pretty well on the bridge. They got the north and south abutments forward. Uh, Ralph and I stopped over today just to look at it. It seems like things are moving along pretty well. Uh, we're pretty happy with the progress. I think they're ahead of schedule by two or three weeks at this point. And going yeah. back to the Memorial Bricks, uh, Melissa, we're hoping that uh, it'll probably be our crew that will install the bricks, uh, get that brick pathway done. We're hoping by we have it down for four by oct end of October, early November to have that completed. Okay. Um, once you have a better date, I can have the bricks. I can facilitate the brick printing. Um, so that would be helpful um, and yeah we will go ahead and put the bricks in and then we'll have extra and then as you get them printed we'll just take one out and put one in and that's how i thought we would do it if that's yep. For you. yep let me know because i'd like to help i'd like to learn how to do it for real will do <laughs> thank you anything else Don? Uh, that's all i have on the uh you know on the project that's going on down at Talleyrand. Okay. Do you have a completion date? Uh, it has to be completed uh, prior to September 30th, I think is the uh, deadline. Thank you. Okay, anything else for Parks and Rec? Seeing none, move on to human resources. John? Okay, uh, we had a meeting on the uh, uh, July 6th uh at which time uh, we discussed the uh initial cut at uh employee reviews for our two direct reports uh we uh we were lucky to have a uh an unpaid consultant joe vasey uh provide us some input uh which uh has been incorporated and uh the uh the second round of revisions has been sent out to uh, the HR committee uh, for their reading pleasure. So uh, please uh, review and revise and send back. Uh, we have uh, two uh, motions. Um, we'd like to make a motion yeah, it's a motion to authorize uh, Ralph uh, to uh, send out a letter to Spring Township uh, supervisors and then also to state police 
uh, so that we could set up a meeting to see, uh, to discuss how we can coordinate our police and EMS services. Uh, EMS would only apply to Spring Township. Uh, we want to learn about each entity and how we can possibly work together so that we can uh, leverage our resources in the most effective manner. So John's um, made that motion. Who's going to second it? I'll John. second it. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Who seconded? I, oh, and I Walker. Okay, Walker. Walker. Okay. And now we can have the discussion, John. Uh, any discussion? Uh, yeah, I think it's a good idea. We've been talking about that for a long time. I hope we can implement it and get it rolling. So good, good job, John. Okay. Okay. Uh, can we take a vote? Yep. If there's no, one, no other questions. We I have one other question. Vote. When you yeah. say Spring Township supervisors, you also including the manager? Yes. He was the previous police chief. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See no other discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Second motion. Okay. Second motion is uh, advertising uh, for uh, three, two to three part time positions, uh, a uh, part time uh, office assistant. Uh, we will have some uh, uh, departing uh, departures uh, later this. Uh, summer or this uh, year uh, and then also uh, uh, two uh, part-time uh, positions of uh, parking enforcement positions uh, all three of these positions will be part-time positions is this uh, also an animal enforcement as well the parking yes yes it is okay i ask a favor if we could uh, the staff assistant if we could post that as a uh, full-time slash part-time just for flexibility would be helpful when recruiting we talk about the office assistant yes okay wouldn't that be a new position uh, it would be to replace uh, kathy stanton who's retiring oh okay, okay. So we big have big a motion big. uh by John, we need a second. I'll, I'll second, second. Johnson. Johnson. Okay. Eaton and Johnson. So we have a motion to consider advertising for office assistant, as well as two part-time parking animal enforcement officers. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Gotcha. I still owe the committee uh, the uh, job descriptions. I'll have those to you by the end of the week. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, anything else, John? No, I'm done. Okay, <laughs> moving on to uh, safety, Randy. Uh, workplace safety meetings have not been held uh, probably since March, maybe February. I think it was March. I think it was uh, March. So there is some additional training needed. I know I missed uh, required training uh, last July. I was I think I was in the middle of retirement and training my replacement, and I was not able to get to it. Uh, I think one of the other members uh, did make it up last Wednesday, and I think Tim Schreffer and I are making it up this this actually uh, this Wednesday. Uh, so, uh, and then I know we talked about the safety committee reviewing the fireworks ordinance. I'd like to get a doodle calendar sent out to the committee for dates and times. Sure. That's it. Okay. Any questions for Randy? Seeing none, move on to water and sanitation. Doug? Thank you, Joanne. Um, you all have a copy of the authority minutes from the last meeting. Uh, but I did want to start off first by you had a question last uh, meeting, Joanne, about the uh, 
large withdrawal of water on one one or two days. Yeah. Ralph, Ralph, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, if my memory doesn't function as well as it should, <clears throat> we had a pump failure that refills the uh, water tower tank that's located behind the uh, Faith Church, I believe. Is that the correct tower, Ralph? That I, I believe that's the one. It might have been the Corning one, but that's you're right on target with what happened. Okay. So what happened was uh, the pr the pump failed to refill the the tank to the level that it was supposed to, and it was discovered, and it was discovered maybe uh, several hours after that it should have turned on. So therefore, to catch up to what was used, there was a big chunk of water that had to be pumped into the tank. So it made it appear as though there was a, a massive amount used in that 24 hour period. Uh, so that that's what happened. That's the explanation for okay. that in the, in the uh, water usage. Uh, the other one, um, I'd like to have a doodle cal calendar, Ralph, for the uh, the uh, discuss the volume of brush collection customers and see sure. how we can deal with that. And um, I know we're we're almost out of brush containers uh, to be sold to the borough. Is that a fair statement, Ralph? Oh, well, we we just got a, a shipment in, but. You know, we are, we're almost a thousand customers, you know, so that is a concern of ours. Yes, and we only have one person operating that truck at this time. And that's uh, right. so, so that's why the committee needs to meet and discuss how we're going to uh, manage that amount of uh, customers. So if, Ralph, if we could put a doodle calendar out to the committee, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing I just want to touch briefly on is if you read the minutes from the uh, Water Authority, you noticed that Kevin Lloyd has proposed uh, uh, helping us distribute some of our water, uh, environmentally friendly, by the way. Um, and in, during that conversation, well, he asked that maybe Belfont would be interested in selling some sort of flavored water. And during the conversation, he suggested if anybody has a water flavoring that they prefer, he would love to hear about it. And he has a company that, that does these mixes, creates these flavored waters um, that he would be willing to share with us. But he's asking for suggestions of what sort of flavored water uh, you might like to be, see created. Uh, we're, we're in the very, very, very early stages of this negotiation. Um, and we have no further details than that. It was just proposed to us. So um, if you have any ideas, send them to Ralph. He'll, he'll collect them all. Um, here's, one, here's one for you, Ralph. How about whiskey? <laughs> we'll see what we can do. <laughs> Watermelon, cucumber. I, I, have, I, I don't drink flavored water, but I know a lot of people do. I think he's looking to even do a carbonated sort of thing. Uh, water, uh, it's, it's, his proposal is really, really excited, exciting for our town for exposure. Uh, so, and you know, to hopefully draw visitors into the town. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Anything else, Doug? I, th I think that's it. Any questions? That sounds good. Okay. Then we'll move on to streets. Keep it moving. Deb? Okay, the Streets Committee met on July 15th, and we were initially joined by Pat McCool of the Cruise, Belfont Cruise. Uh, he had proposed doing a sock hop and an open cruise just on a Friday night. And after discussing all the logistics involved, the Cruise Committee kind of withdrew the proposal. I think with the COVID uh, restrictions and trying to keep the crowd below 250, it was not going to be really realistic to try and hold this event. Uh, LTAP has been contacted to uh, meet with us about the uh, pedestrian crossing at Krauss Park and the Gamble Mill, and also to look at the intersection of Bishop and Blanchard Street, since there have been uh, concerns from the residents about visibility at that intersection. Uh, the parking meter ordinance has been distributed to all of the committee members so that we can just update all of the details. It's not been updated for many, many years and the um, 
Parking fees need to be updated. And also we're redoing some of the parking meter head colors. So we need to get that all straightened out. Uh, I was contacted by a resident on Pine Street who was very concerned about the speed and volume of traffic. Uh, there are increased number of children living on that street and she was concerned about their safety. Uh, we recommended installing watch children signs at both entrances to Pine Street. I noticed that there is one at the top of the hill by where Stony Batter comes up and intersects with uh, Spring and Pine Street. We also discussed changing the stop sign at the intersection of Axeman Road Mill Street and Pine Street from a stop with except for right turn to make it a mandatory stop just to mitigate some of the traffic speed. And if we do that, uh, we would also have to request a stop ahead sign further up Axeman Road just to let people, people know that the stop has been changed, but also warn them that a full stop is coming up. And after looking at, at the look, of this intersection, it's actually in Spring Township. So we would have to make the request to Spring Township to for them to request to have that signage changed. So do we need a motion to do that? I'll yes. make that motion, Brackville. Brackville, second from home. I'll second it. Brackville and Prendergast. My question is if it's in Spring Town, do we is this let me make it. I, maybe I missed something, but uh, we're making the motion to send it to Spring Township. Well, I think we should inquire with with Spring about putting in the stop sign. It's a PennDOT road, but it's actually the intersection is in Spring Township. So, you know, the Spring Township can request it. Whether PennDOT will agree to it is another question. Right. Okay. So it's just a suggestion to mitigate the traffic speed coming up the hill. Is this what we've the path we've crossed before where you cannot use a stop sign to control speed of traffic? Yeah. Yeah, but there's it only a stop sign there. It's just not used as a as a true stop sign. Allows I, I agree. It's it's a right turn. You don't have to stop. If you're turning left, you do. So if you make it a stop sign, then we're trying to slow the traffic down or control speed. And we've tried that at uh, Howard Street and Wilson Street. No, but there's no stop signs there. And, and, and it uh, hasn't been successful, number no. one, because of the traffic count. Number two, we can't use a stop sign to slow traffic. All right. So, I don't know. I mean, I'm all in favor of writing the letter to Spring Township, but it may get kicked back by right. PennDOT because of that reason. The other thing we can do is it, it's good you bring that up, Deb, because that, that demonstrates this is it's only going to get worse. If Ciro, the old Ciro building um, becomes more active and, and they did open up a new brewery there, which is really exciting, um, but that's gonna, going to put more pressure on Pine Street, which uh, reinforces our efforts to have the intersection at Phoenix Avenue and, and um, Water Street get on, get, getting on the, uh, okay. The, yeah, the LTAP. So more letters and phone calls to the MPO would be helpful or more letters and phone calls to uh, Nittany Valley planning would be helpful because as activity increases, it's zero building, hopefully, there's going to be much more traffic on Pine Street. Right, and, and this just pushes vehicles up into a resi residential neighborhood with a very narrow street. You bet, you bet, yeah. So that's my two cents. Thank okay. you. Any other comments, questions? Yes. Go something, ahead. Something you mentioned earlier, um, after having a conversation with someone who's done a lot of work with Homeland Security, I was informed that the um, signs indicating that there are children in the neighborhood are targets for um, um, child traffickers and pedophiles. So those signs, they look for that. Just a thought. Double edged sword. What? Double edged sword. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have yes, Doug. One other comment. Deb, I, I don't know how much you get out and about, and Mike will be familiar with this. But Mike, on the at the sheet store where you turn back to your company. Yeah. The, I don't know the name of that road. Do you know? Rolling Ridge. Okay, Rolling Ridge Road. There's an interesting sign 
for the crosswalk from the sheet store over to the Contra Ford. Uh, it's a big yield the pedestrian sign, Mike. I don't know if you've noticed it or not. Deb, oh, really? <laughs> I meant to take a picture of it for you. Um, I'm sorry I missed the streets committee meeting, but if you're out and about around town, Deb, and you drive back there, you might want to have a look at that sign. It might be one that would be helpful at the Gamble Mill. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a photo of it. Right. Mike, I think check, it check it out, Mike, on your way to work tomorrow morning. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Okay. Back to the motion. Uh, any comments on the motion itself? Seeing none, all in favor to send a letter to Spring Township regarding the stop sign? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay. I think that was an aye for everybody. Okay. So clarification, should we go with the watch children signs or not? There is a watch children sign at, if you're going up Spring Street and where it merges into Pine, where it turns into Pine Street, there is a watch children sign there now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's one, one at the other end. Do you wanna just try the stop sign first and go from there? I think uh, you know, Doug brings up a good point if there's a more suitable sign People need to look at it and decide. And I think the stop sign question to the, you know, the letter going out to the spring makes sense. I've right. also seen uh, children sign that don't say that there's children in the area, but they say drive like your children live here. Yeah, that's you know, a good idea. You got children's signs all over the place. You got schools, you got children's signs. And right. Mm -hmm. There. Talking about two different monsters. Yeah, I, I've I've seen the ones that say uh, drive. Please drive like your children live here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I don't know if they're yeah. legally. That, that sounds like a nice way to kind of balance the two issues. I could live with that. No, yeah, I I would think there's a variety of signage out there that would be appropriate. I think that would be good. <laughs> You can look in that, but meanwhile, go ahead and send the letter just okay. about the stop sign. I wonder if we need the letter to say something about that ch watch children sign. Because uh, that would actually be in the borough. Yeah. Would it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's just it's just one of those things where the intersection we're looking at is you know like fifteen oh. feet past the boundary or something. It's really right. close. All right. Anything else, Deb? Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to energy and environment, Mike. Uh, we had a uh, meeting just the other day on the 16th. Uh, we discussed uh, the air pollution ordinance, and we also discussed the. Uh, um, oh, what's the, we we just talked about it earlier. I I should be able to remember this without having to look back at the notes. Uh, Climate action plan, Mike. Thank you, sir. I can. Yeah, the climate action plan. <laughs> My short term memory is not the best. But uh, and I do believe. While we're, we're considering the motion on on accepting the climate action plan. Yeah. You no, know, we're not going to do that this evening. No, I know, but we are considering it, not tonight. Yeah. yeah. And we, I, you'll have to uh, fill in on a, the PSU sustainability. I was not uh, aware of the, that we had given the program director the suggestions yet. Ralph, do you want to follow up on that? Tell them what this, one of you can tell what the suggestions were and then we sent them to you all already. Oh, I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> I don't have. I've already sent the email to Alona Ballrick. The suggestions were John Eaton's email regarding the Spring Creek Raceway. We requested someone to do a tree inventory within the borough. That's and right. There was a third request that uh, escapes my memory right now, too, Mike. So I also have short term memory. <laughs> there are two out of the three. So I got 66. 66%. We did better than the rest of us. Yeah. Hey, I think the 
The third one was um, the PSU landscape architecture students. Uh, or the, the, the parklet. That's yeah. Did, yes. I, did you say that already? No, thank you, Gina. That's oh, okay. Somebody's paying yep. attention. I, I just found my notes from our meeting. Thank you. <laughs> So regarding the climate action plan, so the next step is for all members of council to review the plan, make suggested changes, send them to Mike between now and August 1st. Then oh, the August, it's gonna be August 15th if you're sending it to me, I'm not gonna be here next month or next meeting. Okay, so, so, and I'm leaving the to the 15th, so I'm also gone at the same time. So why don't we have you do it between now and the 15th of, of August? He'll, Mike will be back, then, then we will do a review after our second meeting and present it for acceptance at our first September meeting. Sounds good. Okay. I'm writing notes, just hold on a second. A next thing on the agenda is Office of Community Affairs, the Planning Commission. Yeah, I'll try to go over this. I was, you know, Planning Commission met on July 13th. They reviewed two plans. The first one was a Shady Lane Plot Realignment Replot Plan. Uh, it's basically adding on some additional uh, square footage, I guess you call it, on the back of lots uh, along Shady Lane that are adjoining the, what I would call the Herlocker property. We do have some of the residents involved in the project and Zach, uh, who is the surveyor, is on the, in our meeting as well. Uh, the, the planning commission did recommend approval. I can bring up the plan if you would like me to. Uh, this Kelly and Emily is is who uh, are with the plan as well, but uh, I can try to answer any questions, or I can bring up the plan if you would like to see it. Council preferences. Plan is in our packet. I think we. Yes, a copy was in the packet as well. I don't see a need to bring it up unless somebody right. hasn't looked at it. So, do, shall we hear from Kelly and Emily and Zach? Yes. one of you wants to go first, go ahead. This is a lot addition. It's some lands that the Herlocker family retained in their ownership and have recently sold at Kim Kelly and Emily. Um, and I'm basically doubling the size of some of the lots along Shady Lane. Um, I made all the changes that Chris Schnur recommended today and emailed the revised plan to Ralph if there's any questions, I'd be happy to field them. Ralph, do you have any concerns about uh, any right away? It looked good. No, to, I, it looked good to me. Yeah, I don't have no concerns. And again, the commission recommended approval. Uh, the one lot uh, will would be accessible off of Oak Lane or Oak Street. The other the other lots are just as you heard added on to existing lots along Shady Lane. So it's pretty straightforward. Kelly and Emily, do you have any comments? No, we're, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a cool question. Okay. Any other concerns, questions? Seeing none, all in, uh, now we actually, are we going to do these one at a time or did you want to do them all at once? I want to just do one at a time. Okay, so we need a motion uh, to accept the Shady Lane lot realignment plan. I'll make the motion. Second, Johnson. Who was the first? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and Johnson, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. Okay, go to the next one. Okay, these these next two are. Ralph, yes, I'm sorry. When can I bring you the mylar? Will you be in tomorrow or 
Yeah, I'll be here. Get call me first, Zach, because our, our front door is locked and I'll okay. be down front or something. But yeah, drop it off. We'll get signatures, you know, take us a couple of days, but we'll get signatures and get them back to you. Okay, so like noon or one, would that work? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you want to tentatively figure noonish, you know, okay. I'll, uh, expect you around then, but uh, try to call just in case. Yep, thank you. All right, thank you, Zach. See ya. Thank Night, you. Night, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. Stay safe. The, the next two plans could be done together. They're nearly identical, but one's considered a subdivision plan and one's considered the land development plan. I'm going to give an overview. We have Bob from Hall Baker Engineering on with us. Uh, he, he can chime in. We can bring up the plans if you'd like. They were in the packet uh, for, you know, submitted uh, out, went out Friday. But this involves what's called the Belfont Laser Car Wash. Uh, basically, Northwest Savings is subdividing off a piece of property along Zion Road. It would be to the, the east side of the Northwest Savings Bank there at Parkwood or Park, yeah, Parkview Boulevard and Zion Road. And uh, the you know, we, we, you know, people who were from the area know it as a, where the Straley's veterinarian office was. But anyway, the, this is the piece where this Belfont car wash would go in. The stormwater will go into the retention pond that is already on the property. Uh, we had a stormwater engineer, Doug, Don Franson, review the plan, had some comments. Those were, those were addressed. Uh, the, both were reviewed by the county and those comments were addressed by our this Bob from Paul Baker and uh, so that, that's the overview of the subdivision plan the land development plan obviously is you know putting the building the driveways all that on the property and uh, the Planning Commission first of all is recommending approval of the subdivision plan they're recommending approval of the land development plan with a condition that the, the developer receives the highway occupancy permit without any significant changes to the plan. Uh, our understanding or the comments were that through the COVID-19 and everything, you know, that, that they've been delayed in receiving the HOP or the highway occupancy permit. But uh, once that's received, we'll review it. If there aren't any significant changes, we all would sign off on the plan if once it's approved by council. Bob, so, let me ask you a question, Ralph. Sure. So that means this will the land development plan will come back to council one more time after highway occupancy? O only if there's significant changes to the plan. Okay. If, it's, if PennDOT basically agrees to the plan with maybe minor calm, we would not bring it back to council. If there's significant changes, like let's say they wanted a traffic light or something like that, or it's a significant change in the driveways, then we would take it probably back to the planning commission for review and then another recommendation back to council. Okay. So do we have a motion uh, to accept the subdivision plan is presented and the land development plan with the condition that the highway occupancy permit is received without significant changes to the plan. Eaton will make that uh, mo or motion. Uh, Eaton? Johnson will second it. Eaton and Johnson, okay. Uh, do we have com comments from the Hall Baker group? Uh, no, I, we're just like I said, um, or like uh, Ralph said, we've been delayed um, with COVID because we have to do traffic counts. And originally, you know, PennDOT slowed us down, shut us down. Um, the traffic counts were just done. Now, the guy that was analyzing them, he was off last week. So um, he started analyzing the information today and uh, hopes to get this stuff turned around to PennDOT. You know, and then from there we can proceed with the, you know, the HOP application and stuff. Um, but yes, as 
you know, we could get conditional approval based off of receiving the HOP. Everything else has been submitted and is in due process. It's just, you know, waiting for, you know, the last couple of approvals to come in for ENS NIPTES and um, like, like Ralph said, uh, Don Franson, I mean, his last comment was, you know, to provide a copy of the NIPTES permit. So um, we're just kind of waiting on the last couple approvals to come back and the PennDOT HOP to come back and uh, everything will be done on the project. <clears throat> Okay. Yes, Doug. Um, for the traffic count, Bob, school is not in session at this time. What sort of impact will that have on the traffic count? Um, what they've done with the whole COVID thing is um, the owner of this car wash has several other car washes and the, the book values they had for the traffic counts were very high. Um, so the owner of the car wash elected to do traffic counts at three other of his car washes. And then the caveat was PennDOT made them also do traffic counts on the streets. And they need to be compared back to actual known traffic counts for the streets to verify, you know, that they're, if, if the numbers are low, that they can be, you know, adequately increased or decreased, you know, to match what the actual flows are. We've had uh, many concerns about that intersection of Parkview Boulevard and Bishop Street. And um, this, this will only add to that congestion, but I am concerned that the traffic count wasn't done during the time when school was in session. Uh, that, that's my concern. And I also, our residents in Parkview um, I forget the name of the road, Ralph, that goes down into the- Parkwood Drive. Yeah, Parkwood Drive. And it's not necessarily a reflection of this new building, but um, there's some flooding issues that are going on down there. And I'm hopeful that this does not, I, I know the engineer says it will have no impact on it, um, but if it does, um, there's gonna be some, some red flags thrown up, so ju just, I hope it's well managed. But as part of the HOP process, the borough will have the opportunity to provide comments. Um, you know, and during this comment period, you know, you can bring up the, you know, the idea of the traffic counts not being done during, you know, school conditions where, you know, there's a lot more traffic on um, Zion Road and stuff. So, I mean, it's not, there's, a, there's, there's more periods of time, you know, once we submit the NIPTES or the HOP permit, um, I know um, PennDOT will reach out or I'll have to reach out to the borough to request, you know, a review of the HOP application. And, you know, you'll have the um, period of time to provide comment back to PennDOT in reference to the, you know, the HOP. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other comments? Questions? Well, yeah, you know, when I saw that uh, that Parkwood Drive stormwater, I brought that up at the last meeting. Uh, you know, now that all the, the removal of all the trees and everything out where they're building the car wash, how is that going to affect runoff and a heavy storm? We haven't had a heavy storm. <laughs> I don't know when the last time was or how bad it may have flooded then, but that's been an ongoing problem out there uh, with just what was there before. And now I think we're maybe adding to it uh, and what precautions are we going to take? How are we going to fix the problem? Because it's been going on for a number of years out there. The last time we talked about it, I think we we're going to run a line out underneath the baseball field. To, well, to, run the water. to, to clarify, so Bob doesn't know anything about what you're talking about, but basically the, you know, the theory behind stormwater is after development, the water is not supposed to leave the property any faster than prior to development. The stormwater basin that is there is to catch and retain the stormwater and release it, you know, no greater than prior to development. The property will be, you know, changed, developed, contoured, and water, stormwater will be piped into that, re that uh, detention basin. So. In essence, I mean, that's, that's how this developer will address stormwater from this property. 
the property you're speaking of, Randy, we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. Uh, it, it's another, it's a PennDOT issue, we believe. But uh, this, you know, Bob and they don't know anything about what you're talking about. Okay. I'm just asking the question if it's going to impact that area. The only, the only reason I brought it up, Ralph, was that I know I most likely will get questions from residents that live down there. So I just wanted to bring it up that we did talk about it and sure. it is being addressed. And I understand how the retention pond is supposed to work. Okay. And for clarity, um, the, the base is being revised. There's gonna be um, additional storage in the bottom. So, I mean, we don't seem like we get normal rains anymore. We get these high intensity, short duration, you know, right. cloud bursts. So the, the bottom of the basin should help mitigate, um, you know, some of these high intensity, short duration storms and provide um, some storage volume prior to any discharge coming from the basin. Sounds good to me. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor accepting the uh, car wash plans? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Say good night. Next. Moving on to HARB. Yes. Uh, next item, you know, the minutes and all that was in the packet, the presentation. We have three projects. The first is a fence project at 455 East Lynn Street. Can and we have a motion for that? I'd like to do these separately because there's something different about each of them. All right. I'll make, I'll make the motion. It. Johnson will make the motion to approve the fence at 455 East Lynn, Lynn Street, right? I'll second it. Johnson and Prendergast. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Next one. The next is a fence and some house paint colors at 412 East Curtin Street. Need a motion to accept this one as presented with the cream color for the pillars to be approved administratively. Correct. I'll make the motion to approve it. I'll second it. That's Clayton? Yep. Okay. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 And then the third one. Next one is 118 East Howard Street. This roof work was done, I'll say in the April time frame. Uh, and they they along with that, this so is after after the fact approval, they want to change the garage doors that are on the front of the building. Oops, my light just went out one second. <laughs> Gotta see what I'm doing here. <laughs> anyway, the exterior front doors, as you saw in the uh, PowerPoint presentation, it's in the packet. The front doors are being uh, recommended for change and they're looking for approval to do that. And also there's some flashing along the alley. They want to put on the lower portion of the brick part, part of the building uh, to address uh, reduce stormwater damage. Uh, so that was talked about and approved. Uh, there's, they try to do some of the color of that administratively. So we have actually two separate motions here. We'll deal with the roof first. Uh, Consider we have multiple metal roof issues. I, I wanna make this clear that what's going happening. Um, so I need a motion to approve the roof retroactively as installed with the caveat that it was installed under duress during the pandemic and options were limited. Uh, any future roof on this building shall not be an in-kind replacement of this roof and then shall be installed as either a standing seam roof or a more appropriate roof. I'll make the I'll make, Go ahead. Go ahead, Gina. I'll make the motion. Second, Go Johnson. Her. Thompson and Johnson. Discussion? I assume that it's the same kind of roof that we've been fighting in. Yes, it is, unfortunately. It'll, it'll be and, but, for 50 years before it comes off. Yeah, <laughs> Catherine, actually Catherine, when she was at the meeting said, they're going to look into some funding to actually take this roof off sooner rather than later and put in a historically appropriate roof on. 
They just don't know how long that's going to take. Based on the pictures that I saw in the, the newspaper, the damage from the roof, it was really necessary, or no, I'm sorry, not in the newspaper, but in our packet. It was, it was absolutely get that critical. Roof on and get it repaired. Yes, so, you're absolutely yeah. right, Doug. The other thing is, can you really see it from the ground? I can't. Not very, not uh, much. You know, it's very close to a standing seam when you look at it. It, it. I don't think it has as high as ridges as some of the other metal roofs that have going in. I, I will also have to say this, looking, looking at the conceptualized drawing, that is going to be a beautiful building when they're well, finished. I agree. So I'm, I'm really excited and glad that they're doing what they're doing. And they, they, just to, too, what right around the corner from me. And what I like about it is they're going to make it as an indoor farmer's market. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is I have a little history lesson for you. I Maybe Don would remember uh, that used to be the Barrow Building uh, at one time. Uh, I didn't uh, know that. Before, Don, before Don, after uh, the fire department. You know, there, there were Barrow offices on the second floor. Oh, oh so it was during. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I remember my mom and dad had me a check, go up and pay the water bill. I had to oh. the and there were offices up there for the borough. Now you're yeah. sure you're, you're not thinking of the old schoolhouse on Blanchard? No, this was Logan. <laughs> no, okay. Check, <laughs> check it okay. out. So, All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, we had a discussion on the metal roof. All in favor of accepting Aye. it with this comment? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. The second motion is uh, the remaining work will be uh, to be accepted as presented, including uh, the windows in the front with the paint scheme, the garage doors, the flashing and control of water on the side of the building. The flashing will color will be approved administratively by the HARB administrator with the assistance of Gay Dunn. That was at the request of the borough that they work with with Gay on this particular set. So it will be a two-person decision in this case. I'll, need a motion. I'll, need a motion. I'll, I'll make the motion. I'll Turn second the it. I'm the guest and Clayton. Discussion? Hang none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Good. We move on to old business. OK. Uh, the first one. We talked about this letter. Thank you. We will certainly want to thank all the organizations for the center of strong efforts, at least the idea of trying to get, you know, recover e economically, but yet do it in a safe manner. So we just wanted to pass on a thank you for the efforts in, in, in that regard. The next item, you know, we want to do the Talleyrand Park Bridge Project payment application number one. It's in your packet. Uh, motion to approve. Yes. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Who, who is the second? Oh, it's right. not, it doesn't matter. Okay, Eaton. <laughs> Clinton and Eaton. <laughs> okay. I'm better she looking at rhyme. Mike. She likes the rhyme. Yeah. <laughs> it, it sounded pretty good there, Mike. <laughs> uh, discussion? And the total amount for the public thing is a payment of, of $1,381.35. Right. And this payment is for work done through June 30th. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Moving on. Next one. Hey, Next Robin. One. Yes. This, can I bring up the CDBG issue since it relates to the payment? Sure. Sure. Uh, I wanted to make council aware two weeks ago at our last meeting, uh, I asked council, or it was a few weeks ago that I asked council for, to transfer some about $37,000 of administrative funds uh, over to the Talleyrand Park project to help us cover the cost of uh, the overall project. As you know, two weeks ago, I mentioned to you that uh, Matt Milliron, who was the CDB administrator from the county, resigned. Uh, that left the void. And then in talking with uh, Ray Stellinus, the plan uh, head of planning at the county, uh, they were going to contract with CEDACOG, uh, 
uh, to administer the projects. So uh, when I found out from Ray last week, they essentially were, ta I told Ray that Matt was in the process of uh, doing a, an amendment to our contracts, to, you know, to change the admin funds over to project funds. And that never got done before Matt resigned. And uh, as uh, in speaking with Ray, what, uh, what the county, you know, what they were going to do with the agreement with CEDACOG is CEDACOG was going to take all of our admin funds to administer the 16, 17, 18, 19 projects. That comes out to $65,107 for projects that we're, we're going to have finished within the next three to four months. Uh, I would like to, I, I talked to Ray and told him that I would like to come to council and see if council would allow us, the borough, to finish out these projects administratively, keeping the $65,000 in the borough, using it for projects and using it for uh, reimbursement for our work on it as well, instead of it going to, uh, instead of it all going to CEDACOG. Um, there's two options on the table. I'm sorry this came up, it just, you know, the county's in a hurry to get CEDACOG uh, moving because they have the COVID funding, which I would, I'm would i okay with the, uh, having the COVID admin funds administered by CEDACOG. And from 2020 on, I had no problem with CEDACOG doing it since they would be working the projects all the way through. But for projects that were already, we've done all the legwork, the bulk of the work is finished. I just can't see the borough losing sixty-five thousand uh, dollars. I think we should handle it in-house and finish this out ourselves. And I wanted to make you aware of it and give you two options: one, let the county go into their agreement with Cedarcog and take the funding, uh, or two, let me go back to Ray and say borough council would like you know the borough to administer these projects that we currently have ongoing with uh, CEDACOG taking over in 2020. I I'll, would, make that, I'll make that motion to the second option. Thank you. Uh, I'll second so, it. So uh, Brackville and Prendergast and the motion <clears throat> is to return administration of the earlier CD, CDBG funds back to the borough rather than move it over to CEDACOG. Correct. For, for the projects that are just about finished. Right. Discussion? Seeing none, all yeah, in favor? My discussion, my discussion right. is Don, good job. Thanks for taking care of that. Excellent. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. So let them know that that's what we want, Don. We'll do. It's Thank more, you. Thank it's you more work on you, but it's not that much less. Uh, it's only three months, and the borough will make out much better with the, you know, the admin funding. Yeah. Okay. So next item is the anti-discrimination ordinance that we've been working on for almost three years, maybe four years now. Uh, Don and I met last week with Carl Summerson, who's the senior attorney for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, Tom Fontaine from State College, and Dave Probolka from Ferguson Township to review the drafts that have come through the three communities. Uh, it's been pushed, put into one draft at this point. Uh, and there's been an MOU between uh, the municipalities and the PHRC that has been initially drafted. It is now being reviewed by Terry Williams at the agreement of all three um, uh, ent entities. Uh, Terry Williams, for those who don't know it, is the solicitor for State College. Once that is done, there will be another meeting to be set up to deal with any questions that have been raised by the solicitor. And after that, it will come to the municipalities for review. Thank you. What are we looking for? This is the anti regional anti-discrimination ordinance that basically creates a regional rather than a borough. Right, but what are we, 
what are you requesting? Do we make a motion? Nothing, just making a report at this point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we won't be doing anything until after we have this review and then another meeting. That's what I thought, but there was a long silence there and I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, no, not, nothing at this point. Um, next is a motion to consider the multimodal grant agreement for the Railroad Street Bridge project. Need a motion? I'll make, make the motion. motion. That was Prendergast and Neaton, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want to give a little bit of information about it, Ralph? Well, this is a railroad street bridge project. And, you know, the county, if you remember about a year or so ago, we had a, well, there was a presentation, Joey and you and I went to at the county, we yeah. received the paper check. And then of course, there's a couple meetings on site. Bing, paper check. <laughs> yes, that's the one. <laughs> hey, this is a, you know, there's still, they said it would be a couple year project uh, and right before, you know, Mike Bloom, who really was, uh, you know, did a lot of work to get the funding and get the project put in place, left the county here a month or two ago. But before he left, he sent over these agreements and said, you know, uh, just some point you need to approve the agreements. So this is the paperwork needed to keep the project moving forward. Uh, the county, the grant that the county received is over a million dollars are in that ballpark. We committed 30,000 to the project, which, you know, won't be needed until there's actually construction. But uh, this, again, is just the paperwork to identify the county, the borough, the partners involved in the project. I think Howard Borough has, it was, it has well, they're, they have some similar money in their project. Uh, but that's a, that's a little summary of the project. Exhibit B, exhibit B, I just want to need Joanne's signature, but for the cooperative agreement, if you've all seen it, I'm gonna, we're going to have to have every single person on council sign it. So somehow we'll have to make a trip around everybody's house and have you sign the document. Oh, joy. <laughs> What's the liability of that? Just, uh, just a question. I think they're just interested in, the, you know, make sure we have our commitment of funding. But uh, obviously, uh, they hold the cars. They have a million dollars they're <laughs> going to put into the project. Any other questions? Uh, Go ahead, Mike. No, I just say bring the thing around we'll sign it. Yeah, hearing no other comments, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Moving on. The Parkwood Drive storm water issue. I, I touched on that a moment ago. We were talking about the one land development plan. As you, some of you know, I can't remember what committee, probably the streets committee a couple of years ago, we met out at Parkwood Drive. We met with some residents about a storm pipe. This is, this is related, it's not the exact same issue, but it's related. Basically that water that's coming off of Zion Road is setting <coughs> down over the hill from Zion Road in behind the townhouses. It's setting there and it's drawing some mosquitoes. And uh, Don and I met out there with a couple of the residents and you know, listened to their concerns. We said we'd bring it up to council and I, I, I'm suggesting a meeting on site with some PennDOT officials and maybe someone from Benninghoff's and Corman's office and try to address the storm water that's coming off of Zion Road because both a couple years ago and this time, the residents are adamant that the problem became much worse after PennDOT put in the turning lane on Zion Road. So. I, I want to show and I want the, you know, PennDOT officials to hear it from the residents and uh, see if we can get some action on addressing the problem. Uh, we did some small work. We have some plans to do, you know, run a storm drain down through the Teener League field. But, you know, we, you know, really the problem I believe has started with PennDOT expanding the roadway along Zion Road. I find that hard to believe. 
Okay. <laughs> so, so do, you need do we motion? need a motion for this or can you just go ahead and do this? I can just go ahead and set up the meeting and I'll, I'll invite the streets committee. I, I was, like I said, I wanted to bring it to your attention and, uh, you know, get, let you know, I do plan to set up a meeting. I think having the streets committee, particularly Deb there would be helpful. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to mention the spraying route? The county got back to you on that. I'm sorry, Don. Spraying the spraying for mosquitoes. Yes, I, I put in the note about it's actually put tablets in the standing water. The county does this as part of their West Nile program. I did reach out to the county and I did get an email uh, from their, their administrator that does the program and they're going to swing by and check it out and uh, treat the standing water. So hopefully do we, it's done soon. Do we know what they're treating it with? No, I don't. Whatever they normally treat West Nile virus with, it's a program that's, that's available year in, year out. We get a letter in the spring every year saying, if anybody knows of standing water, the county has a, has a person that will go treat standing water, usually ponds or uh, something like that. The water hangs around for a while. I would be interested in what they're using. I, I don't know if they use yeah. them. I've used it in standing water. Uh, in well, if it's and if it's PHP, I water. wouldn't mind. I just want some uh, carcinogenic BS thrown in the water just because it's going to kill the mosquitoes. I can't answer what it is. I I just know that they've been treating you know for years. Uh, we've used them out at Musser Lane. There's a couple water low-lying areas that we we now have filled in but before that they were treated well they're not going to be uh reticent with they're not going to hold back the information they, they won't no. no so ask the question <laughs> i can do that i'm, I'm, well, I'm asking I'm with, yes i'm fine with doing that okay so that, that's the extent of the, the project. Uh, we'll be in touch about a meeting. Okay. Uh, we, we had skipped one of the line items under old business. Ad hoc committee uh, met July 15th, uh, looked at the draft uh, sign ordinance or sign ordinance changes. Oh, that's right. We don't really have to look at it tonight, but maybe give the council members a chance to look at it and uh, there's there's it. one additional change that we discussed, but we never actually made it. If I can share my screen, I can show it real quick. I, I think you can. Okay. So uh, when we had the meeting last week, we, we, we talked about this section on religious institution. There was a court case maybe eight years ago or so which they said that you couldn't limit uh, religious signs off property. And so what I did is I looked at the rest of the ordinance and I got and revised this to meet what that has, I understand what the, the court case said. And so we would eliminate when located on the premises, just say they are signs that identify places of worship, then add the maximum area for a sign on the property shall be what we had there before, which is the 25 square feet or, or 50 square feet double phase. And the second, and then add a second sentence and saying all property signage for religious institutions shall not exceed six square feet in size or, and not be attached to a tree or utility, which perfectly matches another section of the ordinance about small signs. Um, and then the other one, um, is a suggestion, and we talked about it and should have been removed, it wasn't, uh, was removing the roll on Raiders example in uh, event signage, uh, because two reasons, one is there's the brouhaha on it, but the other is if the, uh, if the school board decides to change the mascot, then that would be an obsolete reference. So if we just take it out when we're working on this, we won't have to deal with it 
in the future if this should change. And so we had decided to remove that, but we forgot to uh, cross it out. Other than that, what you have there is what it is. And I'll forward this, the word file back to you one more time so you, that you have the correct one. Okay. I think our plan is to send it out to everybody or give people some time to review and add any thoughts to it. Okay. So I'll move on to the next item, keep to try to keep things moving. The strategic management plan, you've probably been wondering where they are behind schedule. Uh, they are to reach out to council members for interviews. I think I saw something Friday. Uh, so soon they'll be in touch with you about getting your input. Yeah, I got my email this morning. Okay. I'm scheduled. Okay, good. But that's all I have under old business. Okay. Anybody have all have any old business? Then well, let's move on to new business. We have two items and we can get out of here. <laughs> okay. Well, the center strong pledge, I, I, I'm thinking we already took care of that. Is that your thinking? Uh, well, no, we need a motion to approve Belfont signing on to the center strong pledge, just like, okay. uh, all right. like uh, the county did. Okay. I'll make that motion. Thompson? I'll, I'll second it. Thompson and Prendergast? Discussion? Um, to, for the public, what, what this will do is uh, sign us up county with the county and businesses in the community to support that we have a commitment to continuing our efforts to help stop the spread of COVID-19. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Moving on to the last item. Last item is consider a motion to create a police services advisory committee uh, this would include identifying the mission of the committee, any authority it might have, the number of seats. Some of these things have been discussed, but this is just the, the formation or getting things moving from the motion perspective of council. So, we have such a motion. I'll make that motion. Eden. I'll second. Oh, Gina Thompson. Now, put Gina down, not me. <laughs> I did put Gina down. <laughs> you just on the committee, right? Yeah. So, Doug, did you notice that earlier she was listed as Johnson and Johnson <laughs> instead of Johnson and Thompson? <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> okay. Um, so this was talked about a little bit last week, and I'm. Doug has got a couple of people who are police officers. I've made a call in to uh, the county and to the center safe program so we can get some experts in this community so they, they can get help us start crafting ideas for such an advisory council. So we're moving along on, but we need a official sanction to go ahead. Could, could I request? Joanne, we also had a, a request. John, I didn't understand a single word you said. Well, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, we also had a request from the chief, uh, a gentleman by uh, uh, Jacoby, uh, Jacobs, I'm sorry. Jacobs. Jacobs, uh, that he, he had requested to be on the committee. Okay, that's, that's good. So there's actually two, four, five people that we think will be working with this. Could uh, members of the safety committee be on that as well, since this deals with public safety? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, Durani, do you want to be on it? Yes. I don't want to have a I don't want to have a humongous committee. I'd like to be. Okay, Randy and myself. Okay. Uh, uh, discussion. Seeing none. All in favor. I think you're getting the committee too big, too large. That's that was my concern. Well, why don't you just reach out to the people and see who has gotten back and figure it out from there? I I have heard back from one saying she was out of town. She's going to give me a call tomorrow. I have not heard from the other person I contacted. 
I think we've had positive responses from two people that that I'm aware of. Yes. I don't know about the others. So, I mean, if Randy wants to handle this and I get off of it, that's perfectly fine with me. So we'd have one council member participating. Is that okay with you, Randy? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. One less thing for me to do. <laughs> uh, okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Any other new business? So I have. Motion to adjourn? No, wait, I got public. I got a comment. Okay. Uh, I'm bringing this up because I had addressed this a few times over the past couple months about a vacant lot that's not being mowed. I don't want people to think I'm ignoring their requests or their complaints. Uh, I've tried to handle it outside the meeting, but I need it to be a matter of record to show that I have requested that this lot be mowed. Uh, it sets on Cherry Lane uh, about it's the last thing in lot before you hit Ridge Street, I believe it is. Uh, so anyway, it's it's been, the stuff is high enough that it's actually laid over. You can almost make hay out of it at this point. And I don't know, you know how many times you're gonna have to mow it unless they're just gonna bail it once they're done. But it is, it is out of control. I just wanna say I did receive Randy's email and probably Two, two notices from Randy. Uh, I refer those to our code enforcement officer, including the picture Randy sent me. Uh, you know, I'm waiting for action. Sometimes it takes time to notify a property owner, but- uh, Just I, drive up the Don Road up, up to Bishop Street and walk in and tell them. I did everything on my end, so we're waiting for action. Have we done any fines? I can find that out, Randy. No, I, don't, I don't know anything other than requesting it and, and what we've talked about. So yeah, that's all. I, I've not heard of any fines, but I can find out. I think it's gone long enough. It is. That, that, that's that point. Sure. Anything else? Point. Motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. I'll second that. I'll second it. <laughs> So Prendergast and Clayton, seeing no objection, we are adjourned at 10.03. Thank you. Everybody. Well, I'll pass my bedtime. <laughs> yeah. Night. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody.